the recording button, so <laughs> from now on everything is efficient. Uh, I have the honor to uh, to welcome you all. I am Bert de Munk from the University of Antwerp and now based in the University of Berkeley. And I welcome you also in the name of uh, Mark Jacobs and Nicolas Polet, who are the co-hosts of this uh, workshop. Just a few words on the context in which this somewhat hybrid workshop takes place. It is a workshop organized by the University of Antwerp, UC Berkeley, and the delegation of Flanders to the USA. And the broader framework behind it is an exchange program actually funded by the Flemish government, the Flemish University Council and the Department for Education in Flanders to be more precise. And uh, the aim of the pro program is to present and discuss the culture, the literature, the history and arts of Flanders, uh, among other things, by a teaching assignment as part of the curriculum at an, an American host institution. And one of which is UC Berkeley. And it is in this context that I teach now for one semester at Berkeley. And another part of the assignment is to host a workshop in which there is also an exchange and a dialogue between scholars from Flanders and scholars from the USA. And the present workshop is the workshop resulting uh, from that. So in a few minutes, I will say a few words about the aim and well, the rationale of the workshop. But I first give the floor to Nicolas Polet from the Flanders House or the delegation of Flanders to the USA, um, who was so kind to co-finance this event and who will officially welcome you all. So Nicolas, you have the floor now. Thank you, Professor de Munch. Thank you, Bert. Um, so by, by uh, now it's officially opened the workshop. So yeah. thanks so much. As, I, as Bert said in his kind introduction, my name is Nicholas Paulette. I'm the Director of Public and Academic Affairs at the Delegation of Flanders to the United States. As most of you know, of course, Flanders is a northern Dutch-speaking region of Belgium. And we are here uh, based in New York City to defend the interests of um, of our of our region and of course promote our region the region of Flanders in all its facets so that's politically diplomatically economically culturally but of course also academically so I would thank you again for uh, for joining today wherever you are uh, on west coast east coast in Antwerp or around the world and welcome you uh, again to this uh, workshop I also like to congratulate Professor de Munch and Professor Jacobs for pushing for putting this together. Both are at the uh, esteemed professors at the University of Antwerp, a beautiful city, a beautiful port city. For those of you uh, on this side of the Atlantic who haven't had a chance to visit Antwerp, you should definitely do so. And I'm sure um, Bert and Mark would be a great hosts as well. So, as uh, Professor de Munch was saying, we're very happy to support this program. Um, our support for this program is really to be seen in the context of our efforts on academic diplomacy. And what is academic diplomacy? It is, of course, um, to strengthen the uh, research, education, and other academic bonds between our uh, Flemish universities and university colleges and um, the more than 3,000 accredited American uh, higher ed institutions here in the States. So of course we work uh, with different universities, uh, Ivy Leagues, but also community colleges, uh, vocational uh, colleges, and also uh, working with different partners uh, on these issues. Um, we're, we work together with Fulbright, I'm sure you know the State Department program, and some of you are, per, are perhaps uh, Fulbright recipients. We also work with the Belgian American Educational Foundation based in Yale, uh, promoting and supporting uh, transatlantic exchanges of students, researchers, postdocs, and professors as well. And a very important pillar in this exercise is, of course, the academic chairs uh, supported by uh, the government of Flanders. And um, these academic chairs are, are three of them in, in the United States. And of course, uh, Peter Paul Rubens chair at Berkeley is now uh, currently um, 
uh, currently uh, for uh, Professor uh, de Munk. We have two other chairs, the Van Dyck chair at UCLA and the Bruegel chair at UPenn in uh, Philadelphia. As you see, the names of these chairs uh, to, to uh, named after our very famous and influential Flemish um, masters, uh, really are, are great painters of the, of the 16th century, really kind of epitomize why these chairs are so important for us. So um, I'm very happy that this program is ongoing, that we have been able to support throughout the many years uh, these chairs. And I also like to thank uh, Jeroen de Wolf uh, at Berkeley, who is uh, the coordinator for these chairs with our uh, department in Brussels. So uh, with that being said, I really want to welcome you all to the workshop uh, Craftsmanship and the Knowledge Society. I think this title is very aptly named because everyone knows that Flanders uh, is known for cutting edge craftsmanship. And I really wish you all a very enlightenment, enlightening, interesting and uh, dy dynamic workshop. Thank you again and uh, good luck. Thank you, Nicolas. Thanks very much. So um, just a few words now about the, the, the logic and the aim of the, the workshop. Um, our workshop actually proceeds um, from the observation that we think a critical appraisal or reappraisal of craftsmanship is needed. And this might a bit that this might sound a bit paradoxical perhaps because craftsmanship seems to be experiencing a return already. So there might be a need for a few words of explanation, I think. Um, until well into the 20th century, crafts were mainly, I think, associated with folklore and nostalgic hobbies of mainly older people perhaps. But in 2021, they are kind of hip again and fashionable again. And to be more specific, they have experienced a return, I think, in at least two fields. In the economic field, modern craftsmanship or modern craftsmen are responding to an increasing demand for products that are perceived as authentic, as well as to concerns about sustainable production and consumption related to that. And in the cultural world, in the meantime, they are enjoying, enjoying the increasing attention to intangible heritage, as it has been put on the agenda uh, by the UNESCO, among other organizations, especially the UNESCO. I think. In both cases, I think crafts are considered an answer to challenges resulting from globalization processes. Because as, as intangible heritage, craftsmanship, I think, ties in with the growing opposition or the, or the increasing questions with the global homogenization of culture and, and related to that with attempts to preserve and promote cultural diversity. And simultaneously, artisanal entrepreneurs are part of a broader trend that in which people seek to, or entrepreneurs seek to develop niche products with less emission, less waste, um, by, by producing closer to the consumer with renewable uh, raw materials, etc. So there is a lot going on already. And the question then is why is there still a need for a critical reappraisal of crafts and craftsmanship? Well, in our view, the increasing attention for craftsmanship in the context of intangible heritage, I think does not prevent the, the persistence of a view or the view that there is a certain contradiction between that heritage on the one hand and so-called modernity on the other hand. All this new attention notwithstanding, crafts are still, I think, dipped in nostalgia in, in both the cultural and the economic field. Crafts are still seen as a science of the world we have lost as something um, non-modern or 
to paraphrase the first speaker of today, Glenn Adamson, as the other of modernity. So you could say that craftsmanship and crafts are in a way locked in in that heritage paradigm. And this might be a strength, of course, because it, 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 it references the authenticity and the, the genuine character of, of, of their products and so forth. But at the same time, it's also perhaps a weakness. And a weakness because it translates into difficulties in, in bridging the gap between crafts on the one hand and the modern economy on the other hand. The modern economy with, it, with it, its great importance of modern technologies, uh, product development, design, and so forth. And at, the relationship with education is perhaps also difficult for this reason, since in education, theories and cognitive skills are invariably almost rated higher than manual skills, especially if the latter also have the, the, the are also perceived a bit as, as old fashioned. So in, a, in, its, in its confrontation with, with modern ways of producing and modern education, crafts are still seen as inferior, non-innovative, opposed to cutting edge technologies and so forth. They might be seen and they are often seen as genuine and authentic, but perhaps not always as up to date and cutting edge. And in order to remedy this, we think it is necessary to explore new ways of evaluating crafts and craftsmanship and to develop new repertoires of evaluation and tools and instrument and, and new instruments for doing so. And today we will therefore present and assess and discuss existing ways in which crafts are evaluated in different contexts. And we will brainstorm and reflect upon new ways and new tools and new instruments for, do, for doing so. The final aim is to transcend, try to transcend the dichotomy between the value as heritage of craftsmanship on the one hand and the repertoires of evaluation um, in the modern knowledge economy and the modern educational context on the other hand. And, and I think yes, in, in order to achieve an interdisciplinary and integrated perspective is urgently needed. We firmly believe that a dialogue is needed between both between different disciplines like history, anthropology, heritage studies and so forth, and between scientific insights on the one hand and underground practices on the other hand. And this is why we have invited not only academics from different disciplinary backgrounds, but also experts working in centers of expertise and representative and umbrella organizations and the like. And last but not least, also practitioners, the craftspeople themselves, which will present, which will be, uh, who will pre be presented to you uh, later on. Mark Jacobs and I are really convinced that only a genuine dialogue between these different types of actors can bring the innovative insights we need. And the focus will be on the values attached and attributed to craftsmanship in different contexts, ranging from the heritage world to the economic world, and with special attention to learning and to the transmission of knowledge and how that connects to the world of education. This is what you can expect from us today. And uh, Mark and I hope we can at least offer you food for thought. Uh, we start with two theoretical reflections. The second is from Mark Jacobs, who will uh, be introduced later. And the first intervention is from Glenn Adamson, uh, who will offer an, in an initial set of remarks to further frame the conversation we will have. Glenn is a curator and writer who works at the intersection of craft, design history, and contemporary art. He has previously been the director of the Museum of Arts and Design, head of research at the VNA, and curator at the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee. And his books, um, which include The Invention of Craft from 2013 and Thinking Through Craft from 2007, these books have served as an inspiration for this workshop. 
And if I'm not mistaken, Glenn will now hark back to them a bit and review different competing values that have been associated with craft in the past and in the present. And I think that this should be a good kickoff to our conversation. So Glenn, it's up to you now. Okay, thank you very much, Bert. And it's so nice to be with you all today. Um, I'm coming to you not from my home, which is in the Hudson River Valley, but actually from Washington, DC. I'm down here for an exhibition that's called Futures. And I mentioned that partly because Porfirio Gutierrez, who we have here on the Zoom, hello Porfirio, um, his work is featured in this exhibition. Um, and of course you'll be hearing from him in just a little while. So it's uh, great to be with you Porfirio and with all of you. I'm so pleased that this uh, conference is happening. And indeed, I think it's a good representation of the groundswell of academic, theoretical, historical, and practical interest in the subject of craft. Um, in addition to the books that uh, Bert mentioned, I am also uh, still serving as an editor of the Journal of Modern Craft, which we think of as the kind of academic journal of record in the field, at least in the English language. And um, through that connection as well, I've just seen an amazing efflorescence of thinking in this area. And it is just amazing to see how many different uh, geographies, methodologies, and perspectives are being reflected in this field now uh, in comparison to when I began uh, thinking about it in graduate school in the 1990s. So I would say, first of all, that the state of this field is very healthy and it seems to be spreading in its relevance and connectivity every day. Um, and therefore this, uh, this conference sits within a very lively intellectual context and it, it seems very well-timed to me. As Bert said, what I'm going to try to do is just really set the table a little bit for the proceedings over the next um, over the next uh, couple of days and the speakers to follow. Um, and what I thought I would do, because there are so many different ways that we could approach this, um, and this is partly perhaps because I have just served on the curatorial team of an exhibition about the future, is to think about the subject of craft and the values associated with craft in terms of temporality. So the first thing I'm going to try to do is talk about competing, in some ways quite contrasting values that are associated with craft that have to do with the past, the future, and the present. And then I'm going to go on to isolate areas of study that seem to be related to those three temporal constructs. So that's the kind of theoretical proposition um, of the remarks I'm about to make. So again, first, the values associated with craft in a past, future, and present temporal mode, and then the actual research that evolves from those three different areas of valuation. So I hope that's clear. So I'll start with the past, and this is very much what Bert just said, which is that craft often, if not in the, in the scholarly imagination or the artistic imagination, then certainly in the imagination of the general public does tend to be associated with the folkloristic and with tradition. And so the key value that is associated with craft in this context seems to be that of reassertion. So in this context, what we have is an idea of craft as a holder, a repository of cultural memory, of generational accumulated knowledge, and therefore something that's often very rooted in place and specific culture, not very mobile. Um, and of course, by definition, backward looking. Now, one can of course challenge these ideas and they have been challenged a great deal. Um, the most important challenge would be perhaps that in order to maintain a tradition, one in fact has to innovate like crazy because the general uh, circumstance or the context in which the tradition is being maintained is itself extremely volatile and um, transformative. And so to maintain the, uh, the value of the tradition, to be that cultural repository. Classically here, we might think of Japan and the Living National Treasure Program. 
Um, in fact, what you need to do is continually innovate in order to keep the tradition looking like it's sitting still, which is quite complex and somewhat paradoxical. And this, of course, can take many forms, uh, everything from material selection to the forms that are being made to processes of training, methods of setting up workshops, integrating technology, um, essentially always or, or almost always in um, an effort to keep the tradition economically viable and maintain its symbolic language at the same time that if you like the back of house is responding to the prevailing conditions of change. Um, having said that, the value itself seems quite clear. So even if it's like a duck in the water and you know underneath the surface, the perhaps people's uh, legs are paddling away like crazy to try to keep themselves going. On the surface, it looks very placid, still, stable. So this is the first modality, the modality of the past tradition and reassertion. The second value is exactly the contrary. And again, Bert mentioned this uh, already. It's the idea that craft is as, as a kind of engine of innovation. And here the key value would be not reassertion, but reinvention. So here we relocate our attention away from traditional folkloristic contexts and instead think about industrial contexts, especially. Um, I, I wrote about this quite a lot in my book, Invention of Craft, and then again in my more recent publication, Craft and American History. And in both of those books, I pointed out that the Industrial Revolution itself, which is always for good reason, juxtaposed with craft as a kind of contrary historical force. Uh, when you start to look at the Industrial Revolution in any detail at all, what you realize is that it was entirely the creation of craftspeople and prosecuted by craftspeople from its inception all the way through the 20th century. And that's true of everyone from um, steam engine builders in the late 19th century through factory builders in the 19th century, all the way to Henry Ford, who began his career, after all, as a highly skilled apprentice machinist. So you do not have an industrial revolution without artisans. You do not have machines without artisans, machine builders. You do not have um, innovation to this day in our most technologically advanced companies, Apple, Google, et cetera, um, without pro skilled prototypers. You do not have nu a nuclear power industry without people who can actually build the plants uh, in fact, you don't, as I pointed out in, in my most recent book, you don't have the atom bomb without skilled craftspeople because the first atom bombs were, of course, hand built by electricians and metal workers and engineers. Um, and just a, a, a kind of fun aside here, uh, just to kind of get across the, um, the image that I'm trying to paint for you, um, the artist Alexander Calder actually relied on nuclear power plant welders to create his sculptures for a good part of his career because he was based in France and he was um, he, he you know he looked around for the most skilled welders that he could find and of course money was no object because he could sell these sculptures for a great deal of, um, of money and so he settled on a firm that actually uh, built uh, seal seals for uh, for nuclear power plants. And they immediately shifted over into being art fabricators. So that's the kind of example that I'm trying to uh, illustrate to you. But the key point again is that craft is not only can be, in fact, but in fact always is located at the cutting edge of technical innovation. And if we have a broader understanding of what craft can consist of, simply focusing on, uh, as I always define it, uh, skilled um, skilled making at human scale then we can see that, again, not only is craft compatible with innovation, but it's absolutely necessary for it. So here, craft is associated with the idea not of tradition and reassertion, but innovation and reinvention. And then the third temporal modality that I want to mention is, of course, that of the present. And here, we're thinking about the value of humanism, and we're shifting, again, away from the practical now and more towards the ethical, and you could even say the spiritual for many people. And here, um, the, uh, the value is that of reassurance. So re reassertion, reinvention, reassurance. 
And the reason I use that word is because I think that whatever complex arguments one can make about Kraft's position in a political and economic spectrum, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, but the, the really crucial thing that seems to keep people coming back to Kraft as an idea and also as a life practice seems to be a kind of um, reflection of our innate human capabilities. And particularly as the Industrial Revolution began in the classic formation of Marx uh, to transform all that is solid and melt it into air. And now, of course, our digital experience, which has this frictionless set of glide paths that seem to dislodge us from our immediate surroundings so readily. Craft is often that reassuring thing that keeps us feeling grounded, grounded in our culture, grounded in our physical environment, grounded within materiality itself, and gives us a sense of anchor points into all of those realities, which of course are absolutely crucial for, in, for nurturing us as biological beings who have evolved not over, over 200 years, but over 2 million years to the animals that we are today. And craft seems to offer a kind of essential connective tissue for us to, as it were, stitch ourselves into. And so it has this deeply, deeply emotionally reassuring effect, which to my mind is the principal motivating factor that is behind the hipness, as Bart, as Bart called it, the, the current hipness or currency of uh, craft. And one can see that this is a, in some ways a simple matter of simply responding to the digital you know, we're so dematerialized in all of our activities, look at what we're doing right now over Zoom. Um, and so craft offers itself as a ready remedy to that, but it is more complicated than that because it goes back, as I say, at least to the period of the industrial revolution. And it has dimensions that are not secular, you know, that are deeply infused with religious and spiritual value that are highly geographically and culturally relative and yet seem to offer what at least seems possibly like a kind of universal uh, grounding into materiality. Okay, so that's the first half of my remarks. Again, just to review, what I'm suggesting is that the values of craft can be framed in terms of past, future, and present. And that means thinking in terms of tradition and reassertion, innovation and reinvention, and humanism and reassurance. A kind of triadic structure. And now what I want to try to do in um, hopefully a slightly more rapid conclusion is to point to areas of study where these three temporal modalities are at work. So I'll go back first to this idea of tradition and reassertion. Um, here, I think what we see is um, probably the, the largest body of, of work that's being done on craft right now, which has to do with a kind of inclusive imperative to simply tell the stories of craft worldwide. So this is an attempt to um, remedy a longstanding neglect on the part of art history, to a lesser extent, maybe even anthropology, where you would expect this work to have been done more um, frequently. Um, but looking at the whole global array of craft practices stretching back into the past, and in particular, to think about the transformation of those craft practices under the pressures of modernity, which seems to be the, the critical thing about this um, direction of, of scholarship. I already mentioned the uh, fact that um, traditions need to be innovative in order to remain apparently stable. That is one leitmotif of this work. Brian Moran's work on Japanese uh, ceramics would be a good example of that. You also have um, a very strong focus on gender in this context. So there's an emphasis on the role that women in particular have played to a slightly lesser extent, the, the role that uh, uh, queer identifying people have played in thinking through uh, traditional crafts as means of identity formation. And then paralleling that you also have what I would broadly describe as a kind of post-colonialist emphasis on these craft traditions where um, what's at stake is not only the impact of modernity, but also the impact of imperialism and foreign domination on craft pro processes and the way that they're transformed. 
Um, just one other example of this would be the um, search for uh, origins. This is a more art historical way of looking at it, but the search for origins of abstraction, because you know, for generations, we were all taught that abstraction began with Malevich, Mondrian, and Kandinsky in about 1910, 1912, depending on who you believe. And then it was pointed out, well, actually Hilma F. Klint, the Swedish visionary artist was doing it five years earlier. So actually it's a woman that invented abstraction. And then of course your next thought is, well, what about tantric paintings? What about Navajo sand paintings? What about Aboriginal art? Hey, hang on a minute. What about all the textiles that have ever been made practically, apart from pictorial tapestries in Europe? Most of them are abstract. What Porfirio is doing is abstract and he's looking back at a tradition of Zapotec weaving that goes back deep into history. Most of those works have been abstract. Why did we ever think that Malevich, Mondrian, and Kandinsky had invented this, right? So that's that's a really good example of the kind of radical transformation that happens when you think about tradition in this more open-minded way. Okay, second area of study, which is more to do with innovation and reinvention, is of course, first of all, the study of industrial craftspeople, industrial artisans, as we often say. This is a really um, important growth uh, area in the field. I tend to associate it here in the United States, particularly with someone called Ezra Shales, who um, wrote one of the best things that we've ever published in the Journal of Modern Craft, which is about the Empire State Building as a handmade object. And he thinks about the way that that played into the politics of the time in New York City. And he's also then done a lot of work on um, craftspeople working in particularly ceramics factories, but also other industrial contexts. But it's not just Ezra, there's lots of people that are looking at this now, you know, everything from pattern makers, you know, carvers who were making uh, the models or patterns for cast iron stoves, for example, that would be a great example. Sarah Fay and Scarlett wrote a great article about that in the journal a few years ago. Um, also, the, um, the people that are starting to look into machinists, uh, ideas of tool use, um, in, uh, in, uh, in industrial factory contexts. And then the other um, area that I'll just mention in terms of innovation and reinvention, how that's being studied, is the more theoretical set of issues that arise out of um, the patient analysis of work that's being done in industrial contexts. And I, I think of this as a kind of, uh, you know, benevolent repurposing of the Taylorist idea of time and motion studies, where, you know, you had Frederick Winslow Taylor, you know, standing there with his stopwatch and counting out the seconds that it took somebody to perform a certain task. Well, that's obviously a deeply oppressive way of thinking about skilled work, but there's a much more uh, liberating way of thinking about it, where we start to theorize issues of somatics or flow. Mihaly um work on that, of course, is very influential. And then we can think in a more post-humanist context about what happens when um, we start to introduce ideas of robotics, partnerships between human and artificial intelligence, um, and also thinking about the role that new technologies like 3D printing or CNC, computer numerically controlled carving, uh, laser cutting, what happens when we bring those kinds of tools into the craft equation? I don't know if that's post-humanist exactly, maybe it's just an expansion of the toolkit, but certainly we have to then think about how we mobilize our present understanding of craft in relationship to these new tools. So that's another area where innovation is really pressing craft scholarship into new territory. And then I'll just finish by talking a little bit about where I see craft scholarship focusing when it comes to the core value of humanism. Uh, this, as I mentioned earlier, really has to do with ethics and brings us into the question of craft as an economic proposition, a political proposition, and also as a social value. I was very concerned in my most recent book, Craft in American History, with how craft it seems to serve as a kind of connective tissue for the nation, for the United States. One way that I thought about this is that in the 18th century and even in the 19th century, craftspeople seem to have been, if you like, the most upstanding citizens of their communities. And in fact, when you set up a community in uh, on a frontier, you know, uh, in a frontier situation in America, 
the first people that you needed were craftspeople. You needed to attract them in order to build a, com a community that could function. And intriguingly, that also remained true in the utopian communities of the 19th century, thinking here about the Shakers or other, um, other uh, separatist or religious utopian communities in the 19th century. What happened with the growth of the Industrial Revolution and the spread of mechanization is that craftspeople were increasingly marginalized from those central positions in communities and in urban contexts as well. And while that obviously had an economic impact, first and foremost on the craftspeople, I think that it also had a tremendous social impact because it dislodged craftspeople from this central um, role in, in, in dictating citizenship that they had had. And the kind of cartoon image here would be Paul Revere, you know, our revolutionary craftsperson, or Betsy Ross, you know, they're the representative feature, uh, figures of the revolutionary era in many ways. And of course, we don't have people like that anymore because we don't have craftspeople that have that central trusted position in our culture. And I think that is a huge loss um, in any kind of democracy, um, in any political system, really the role that the craftsperson plays as a citizen, as a representative citizen, and also as a connection point between other citizens seems to be absolutely crucial. So we have this ethical quandary as to what to do when the heart has been ripped out of our communities, that heart having been traditionally the craftsperson. Um, and I think this is the other deeper reason that craft has a kind of currency that it didn't previously. Um, you know, there, there seems to be a kind of divisiveness uh, and brutal opposition that's entered into the politics of certainly America and also many European countries and elsewhere in the world. And it seems to me like craft is perhaps a solution, partial solution to those problems. Um, the other uh, aspect of, of the, this, of course, is climate change, which I'm sure we'll talk a lot about over the proceedings of the conference. Um, this is a little more difficult because, at least as far as I can tell, craft is actually not particularly ecological in most cases, because if you really want to make a large number of objects for a mass market, what you probably need is mass efficiency as well. You need economies of scale, and craft is not good at that. That's why it's always been so economically marginal. And that actually translates into ecological considerations as well. So one way to think about this is, you know, if you just are going to have one teacup just for functional purposes, you want to sell it for as affordable a uh, price as you can, um, but you also want it to be as ecological as you can, how will you make it? Well, you certainly aren't going to set up a little kiln somewhere in the countryside and deal with all of the distribution, material sourcing, fuel um, implications that that isolated studio is going to have, what you're going to do is set up Ikea and you're going to be producing teacups by the hundreds of thousands over the course of the year, optimizing every single aspect of the production system to make sure it's as ecologically friendly as possible. And so this is actually a real problem for craft because I think um, that in most cases, craft is actually not that sustainable. And this is a really critical kind of externality to everything else that we're thinking about and I think craft scholars and crafts people need to be serious about how we think about our role in relation to climate change, just like every other field. I think there are ways of challenging this brutal reality, one of which has to do with that R&D function, that innovation function that craft has, that perhaps we can discover new ways of doing things, new ways of creating uh, manufacturing objects that um, themselves need to be prototyped and just like an atom bomb that's going to require craftspeople so that might be a role um but I, I i do think that this this particular topic requires a lot more thought in our field and i you know welcome contributions to that aspect of craft studies from scientists and engineers as well as from you know cultural historians and art historians like myself um so i'll i think i'll leave it there again just to review what I've tried to do in these remarks is give a kind of past, future, and present set of frameworks for thinking about craft, and then talk a little bit about the areas of study that I see unfolding in, in um, craft scholarship now, broadly under the headings of inclusion, uh, industrial artisans and theory, and then ethical, political, maybe even activist contexts. Um, 
for thinking about craft in action. But the last thing I'll say is that, as you can see from just this very, very brief summation, it's super complicated. And the apparently simple idea of craft, just making something skilled with your hands at human scale, that turns out to generate an, an enormous set of questions uh, and possible models and topics to be considered from a historical perspective, from a historical, uh, from a theoretical perspective, artistically, um, technologically, etc. So, although uh, there are many of us gathered here, and there, you know, relatively speaking, there's been an absolutely enormous um, kind of bumper crop of uh, publishing in this area over the last few years. I sort of feel like we're just getting started, and so very much welcome your uh, thoughts and ideas and. Um, Congratulate the organizers for setting up this conference and wish you all the best with your deliberations. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Thank you for the uh, excellent opening, I think, for the discussion. Um, I suggest to, we are, there are a lot of people in the room. I'm not sure how to arrange the discussion yet, but I suggest to first move to Mark's um, uh, talk and then have a discussion after. Um, Mark's talk and have questions afterwards. And I, I would also suggest to use the chat as much as possible. I'm not sure how many people will try to or want to intervene, but uh, we have the chat and in the chat, we can then kind of uh, perhaps synthesize some questions or group some questions and so forth. So you're all invited to, to drop your questions uh, in the chat and then, but we'll first move to, to, to Mark then. Um, and um, yeah, Mark is uh, not only a co-organizer of this event, he's, he's also especially, and most of all, an expert in heritage studies. He teaches critical heritage studies at the University of Antwerp. And in his research, he examines um, recent 21st century cultural heritage paradigms. Um, and he does so with attention for both policy uh, policy making and practice. And on top of his uh, academic career, Mark has been the founding director of FARO, which is the Flemish platform and support center for heritage. And he, he was also uh, in the same period, member of the Flemish UNESCO Commission of Cultural Heritage. And at the Free University of Brussels in Belgium, he coordinates the UNESCO chair or, on critical heritage studies and on safeguarding the intangible cultural heritage. And I think in his talk today, Mark will assess potential new analytical tools. And I give him the floor for that now. Mark. Okay, thank you very much. I tried to uh, share my PowerPoint. So thank you very much uh, yeah. Beth, and for this initiative. And uh, I would like to give a very brief presentation and evoke a number of ideas. And to do that, I would like to refer to, let me see if I can like to refer to a documentary that was published two days ago. And it was uh, a tribute to Jan Blomart, who was a professor in linguistic anthropology and uh, unfortunately, he passed away uh, a few months ago and his friends uh, compiled a video that was launched officially two days ago at the University of Tilburg, but also the University of Antwerp and many other places. And he gave a number of ideas uh, to think about. And he started, so in this uh, video that you can watch online on, on YouTube, he starts with emphasizing the role of uh, words and language in shaping the way we perceive things and how uh, life is organized. And in the beginning of the video, he starts with the reflection on uh, two words in Dutch, as we are uh, in this multilingual setting. I can use these words in Dutch. On the one hand, the word werkgever, so employer, in English, and werknemer, uh, the employee. And what uh, Jan started with is to reflect upon these words. Are these our words? Because if he thinks about who is giving the work, 
and who is taking the work, who is giving the labor and who is taking the labor. And he uses this example as, as a way uh, uh, to discuss the power of words and also uh, to uh, investigate the power relations connected to words. And one of the things Jan Blomart has done in his uh, work, and also in the last uh, months before, unfortunately, he died uh, due to suffering uh, throat cancer, he uses uh, to produce a whole series of small videos talking about specific words and specific concepts that are uh, being used in social sciences and anthropology, sociology, and so on. And he emphasized a lot of the notion of framing and frames. And he also, in one of his recent publications, focused on the notion of boundary objects. And that, this is one of the concepts I would like to uh, use uh, in the rest of my talk. At the end of this video, uh, Jan Blomart uh, expressed that something interesting was going on in the end of the 20th century, especially in the 21st century, the role of social media and the internet. And uh, although most of his talk is in a more pessimistic mode about how the world is evolving, he did say that something unusual happened in the last months of his life, and he was referring to a number of protests that were uh, going on in Brussels and other cities related to the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. What happened to uh, George Floyd, it had an impact also in Belgium in sensitizing and making people aware of a number of power relations. And this was connected to protests against Leopold II and a number of statues. And he said, thanks, due to social media and things, a, a number of these tools like boundary objects and even Black Lives Matter as a concept is one of those examples of boundary objects that gained a lot of uh, force. So what are boundary objects? It's a concept coined by Susan Lee Starr and James Grissom. Uh, and they did it in a study of uh, a museum uh, in the place where Bert is actually now uh, uh, working in Berkeley in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. And uh, in order to understand how this museum was created and how it functions, uh, Susan Starr launched that concept of boundary objects. And what are they? These are objects that are both plastic enough to adapt to local needs and uh, the constraints of the several parties employing or using them, but also robust enough to maintain a common identity across these sides. And these objects may be abstract or concrete. A boundary object could, for instance, be the notion of a craft. And how did they uh, use it? In fact, these are two figures on, on the left. You see Joseph Grinnell, who was the, one of the scientific collaborators of that museum. And he was also one of the people who uh, developed the notion of ecology and how to study uh, ecological uh, aspects. And I guess in the course of this uh, evening or for you morning, uh, we'll talk, probably talk about the ecolo ecology of, of, of notions like crafts and, and craftspersonship and so on. You also see uh, one of the ladies behind the whole uh, museum who financed it and, and thought about it. And the small uh, uh, figure you see on, on uh, the right uh, uh, side, on top you see the, the model called the translation model by Michel Caron. And it actually says how in actor network theory, how specific power relations are structure, structured and how uh, things can be in a kind of Machiavellistic way try to combine a lot of stories and allies to an obligatory passage point and try to keep that obligatory passage point stable. That's one way of how science is organized or how things in society are organized. Susan Lee Starr said, well, it doesn't actually always work like this. You also need uh, a negotiation model with a lot of points of passage and 
some coherence uh, that is established by boundary objects. Okay. So on the one hand, that concept, it's a concept we need, in, according to me, studying crafts. Another is the notion of frames and framing, uh, because why are one of the questions we are asking ourselves, why is uh, crafts and, and why are crafts persons today so important? Because something has been reframed and frames have shifted. And I do, in recent work, I've been rediscovering the work by Irving Goffman, Frame Analysis, the toolkit of concepts he launched there. I think they are, they can be uh, mobilized in, in recent research. And one of the most important reframing operations uh, in the 21st century in our field is on the one hand, the fact that the notion of heritage is become the overarching frame. The fact that now I'm teaching in a heritage department, it's one of the consequences of this huge reframing operation that makes heritage or a concept that works and invites us to view a lot of things in reality through that reframing uh, and in that frame, there have been subframes that are extremely successful in the notion of intangible culture heritage in combination with safeguarding intangible culture heritage is one of those uh, success stories in reframing uh, and rebooting a whole system of thinking about traditions and traditional culture. And the little blue book you see here is one of those boundary objects that is used to, to change discourse, policy, and practice all over the world. And together with a number of colleagues, we have been studying the effects of this, uh, this operation that has had a number of effects. First, uh, emphasizing the role of communities, groups, and individuals, and empowering them to try to free those groups and individuals, and also experts from an older vocabulary, like the vocabulary of folklore and uh, notions like authenticity and uniqueness, etc. All these concepts have been questioned and been rebooted in a new system. And uh, on the right side, you see uh, a booklet that was one of the results of a project. Uh, uh, a number of colleagues in, uh, in Flanders and, and in Europe uh, organized together to examine the role of museums and this new frame of heritage uh, in transforming, not saving classical uh, ways of working with culture. Okay, well, in that blue book, you find a number of tools, like for instance, the operational directives of the convention. And there are a number of topics that are directly relevant to uh, what we are studying. The fact that they are in, this UNESCO text called the Operation Directives, and in the Blue Book, they try to reorganize the, the, the discourse and the framework of how to think about uh, heritage. And you see here uh, three of those uh, subdivisions where they try to connect cross-personship, uh, cross-traditional handicrafts, and sustainable development. Mm -hmm. And another of those boundary objects are, of course, the sustainable development goals that are related. And you see here, and I, I will uh, point at the number of phrase for instance, in Operation Direct 183, that uh, people are invited to think about systems of sustainable development that depend, depend upon stable, equitable, and inclusive economic growth based on sustainable patterns of production and consumption. And they uh, should be linked, and that's what the previous speakers said, to affordable, re reliable, sustainable, renewable, and modern energy. And uh, if you look at 184, the last sentences, it's also trying to uh, empower communities, groups, and individuals to make choices for collective and individual. Other parts of that boundary object in the blue book is 184. Operation Directive 185, where uh, once again, groups and communities are invited to organize themselves and to think about what 
these forms of intangible cultural heritage like crafts can offer for generating income and sustain, sustaining livelihoods for communities, groups, and individuals. As always in UNESCO, there's also the backside of the medal. And you can see that in 185.B number two, where they warn the fact that communities, groups, and individuals should be the primary beneficiaries of income generated as a result of their own intangible cultural heritage, and that they are not dispossessed, in particular in order to generate income for others. And that's one of the challenges if we think about uh, mobilizing crafts to address sustainable development issues, how this uh, works. And if we go on in those operation directives, we find the same ideas on the one hand, using it for productive employment. And the very last sentence, once again, this warning about dispossessing people in order to create employment for others. So there's, there's this one. This brings me, brings me to the last slide. I, I think that the whole field generated by this reframing operation of UNESCO, but we need a number of tools to uh, work with this. I would like to point at two recent publications. On the one hand, uh, uh, a discussion launched by Diana Taylor. She's the author of the famous book, The Archive and the Repertoire. And she has added a new uh, chapter in her model uh, called Save As, the fact that in digital, uh, in digital heritage, we have to transmit things to the future by transforming them. And you, you, you can, like you can save this PowerPoint as a PowerPoint, but also as a PDF, etc. This notion is something used by Diane Taylor to rethink the whole way uh, we use archives and documentation and so on. And the book on the right, it's a book that has just been published, Controversies Mapping by Tommaso Venturini. In it, he uses, uh, he introduces a whole set of uh, tools on the web to explore controversies, but also to work together with a number of groups trying to assess the values and the contradictions in notions like cross and cross, crossmanship, and how to connect them to these goals of sustainable development, how to keep control, and how to uh, map these controversies and also how to use them. And one of the things I would propose for the, the next years is to work with these tools and develop them and to use that idea that Jan Blomart said, look at the words, explore them, deconstruct them, and use uh, modern technology of trying to organize conversations uh, to uh, think about this. So I would like to Stop it there and take any questions. Okay, thank you, Mark. Can you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. This was also, uh, as with Ben, very, very, very close to what I was hoping to uh, <laughs> to hear from you. The, the kind of talk, very interesting and very inspiring. Uh, I now look to the chat. There is at least already. One question, I think, um, well, from Lothar. I'm not sure, Lothar, can you perhaps pose your question aloud? Yes, I think it's also a good I one for- I try to. I think it's also a good one for Mark, actually. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, uh, no, because, but I was intrigued when, when uh, Glenn was talking, Specifically, in, in in his first first uh, uh, point, where he pointed out craft as a tradition, and also really linking it to communities. If I make the bridge to nowadays, and if I look at many young artists and people that work around craftsmanship, I often see that that, that what they are doing is actually rooted in traditional ways of, of skills of dealing with with the subjects they're 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 addressing are very personal subjects. They're not really community linked. Often for them their craft is really a way of expressing something that is deeply connected to themselves and sometimes even very personal. So I was interested to see how you reflect on that and if that is the same all over the world in that perspective or is this is something more that you link to smaller artistic circles, for example, in cities where it often happens. Uh, that's, I guess, the question I was asking. 
Yeah, thank you, Lothar. Um, the, the way that I would be inclined to frame that is as a, a dialectic between individualism and collective or community-based identity. And that is indeed one of the most important dynamics in craft history and in present craft practice. I do think it's quite culturally specific, so I wouldn't want to try to be too, uh, I wouldn't want to try to overreach too much. I mean, certainly in the American context, individualism is uh, an almost sacred cultural value. And what you often see in a fine art context, let's say, or even in, its, in a design context, is that craft is being mobilized almost as a way of articulating the relationship between our somewhat over-identified relationship to individualism and our need to have a kind of collective identity, um, either regional or local, what have you. I think that in other geographies, you would have a, a different uh, set of factors in play, often to do with religion um, and the question of how the individual relates to the faith, as, so, which is a very different way of thinking than, than a secular community. Um, so that you might, for example, have um, a craft practice that expresses a kind of uh, personal, uh, maybe even private belief structure, but is embedded in a broader religious framework. Um, so that would be just one other example that's obviously very different from the politics of individualism that prevail in America. But I think you're certainly right to point to that as one of the key um, the key things that craft does. You know, it, it it seems to me like it's almost always, maybe partly because skills are handed down and also shared within a workshop or a broader community. It, it seems to me that craft almost always does that thing of dialectically relating individual identity with group identity, and that much of its interest and cultural power comes from that relationship. And I, I would actually say that that's something that crosses over my three temporal constructs. I think you could see the individual, um, the, the dialectical relationship between the individual and the group playing out in all of those different areas, all those different contexts. Thanks, I, I, I just wanted to bounce that to Mark briefly before we go to the next question, because Mark, um, in, in the rebooting and the new, and the new frame, UNESCO framework of, the, uh, of intangible heritage and craftsmanship in specific, there's that very much a stress on the heritage community as well. Do you see a, a tension there with, with a more economic context and an entrepreneurship related to craftsmanship? I don't think there have to be that tension because, of course, one of the nice things about this UNESCO operation is that they actually have not defined any of the concepts that are being used in the convention nor in the operation directive. So what the community is uh, can be crafted uh, to specific goals. And my interpretation of what these communities and groups in the UNESCO uh, jargon are there are networks and actually networks that can be created to obtain a number of goals. So if people want to organize themselves to go for sustainable economic uh, goals, that's, that's perfect. And, the, and they can use the notion of heritage community to do that. Mm -hmm. That's one side, but on the other side, and that's what, what I, also wanted to express they will bump into a lot of contradictions because there's some tension between global sustainable development goals and what perhaps local groups and communities think that their interests or their values are. So there's th this connection and the UNESCO convention and the things to work with do doesn't offer solutions to how to do that. So we will have to agree in groups and networks how to deal with this. I don't think there's a formula that solves it, but uh, there's perhaps a way to discuss with this, uh, about this uh, collectively. Is yeah, that thanks. an answer to your question? <laughs> okay. yeah, 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 very much, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, but that's an, inter an interesting uh, tension. I think we have, to, uh, we have to take into account in our future, uh, in, in our future discussions, I think. We have time for one more question, 
I, I think, um, and I have one in the chat from Michael Friedman. Perhaps it's... Uh, yeah, you... I can just... So yeah. do you hear me? I can just ask it well, yeah. loud. So actually the, the question, Glenn, I guess, uh, thanks for the talk, um, which was very inspiring, I have to say, because, exactly because of these values that uh, you associate to it. Um, and what I'm interested in is exactly this invention discourse, which is, um, I don't know if you would agree, but is highly problematic because it, it has this narrative of progress as if we are just getting better and better. Um, but this is obviously wasn't always the case. That is, uh, as I wrote, textile practices, which were pretty much the first to be mechanized in Europe. Um, before that, there was, there was no need to invent anything, so to say before the I know, stocking frame uh, with respect to knitting or the, um, the automatic looms that came afterwards. Um, so I was wondering how do you actually frame this, well, the discourse of invention, uh, because that, as I said, it wasn't always here. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I think you're, um, you're pointing to it very usefully to a contradiction between the first two values that I mentioned. Um, so the one obviously being uh, emphasis on tradition and uh, kind of retention of historical accumulated knowledge and the other being a form of um, almost disregard for that inherited knowledge. You know, there's a reason that Joseph Schlumpeter influentially defined capitalism as creative destruction because that idea of progress and invention often involves uh, economically or otherwise destroying established frameworks of value and ways of, of making and knowing. Um, I think, so that's absolutely right, that there's, there's a, an inherent uh, push-pull in at the heart of craft because two of its most cherished values are directly opposed to one another. I think there's also another way of responding to your question, which has to do with the specific uh, notion of invention as progressive. And so here I'm just thinking about my own book, Invention of Craft. And just to say, um, it might be important to kind of flesh that out a little bit. The reason that I called the book that is not because I'm, in, I'm wedded to a progressive model of craft as you know, just making things better all the time as like an engine of improvement, um, far from it. The point of the phrase is to say that when the industrial revolution occurred, craft was invented as an as actually Bert just, um, just Bert mentioned this in his opening remarks, craft was invented as an other to the industrial revolution. So um, whether or not you think that invention has a deeper history than the industrial revolution, one thing you can say for sure is that craft as a charged cultural value didn't exist as such before the industrial revolution because there was nothing to juxtapose it to right? Making things by hand was the only way of doing anything. So the idea that it would be somehow freighted with a certain set of cultural values, that obviously doesn't make any sense because it, you know, it's like, it was like gravity for the economy um, and for manufacturers. So it's only once you have the opposition between industrial um, production, division of labor, mechanization, and craft as a human scaled uh, way of doing things, that you start to have a conflict that can actually generate all of these ideas and dynamics that we're here to talk about. That's, that's the basic argument anyway. So that, and of course, again, that's not a matter of saying that um, this is a form of invention that improves things because quite, again, quite the contrary, because it was bound up with imperialism and the domination, just for example, of Indian uh, artisan communities by British extraction, um, you know, politics as embodied by the East India Company. So I would be the last person to frame that invention as a progressive or, or benevolent phenomenon. It's intensely po political and something we're still working through, again, as I mentioned, through a kind of decolonialist um, framework. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. This was also, I think, all, already a good example of the discussions uh, we were hoping to have. But the time's up now. We, uh, we have, of course, a, a general discussion 
afterwards, but it's time to move now towards, uh, we have three practitioners listed now for the next three interventions. And the first is uh, Porfirio Gutierrez. Uh, and uh, Porfirio is a California-based textile artist and natural dyer who was born and raised in the historic Zapotec textile community of Teotitlan del Valle in Oaxaca, Mexico. I'm probably not pronouncing this very well, but um, uh, Porfirio sees innovation as the key to the well, it links up very, very well to the discussion uh, uh, we had, uh, because Porfirio sees innovation as the key to the, the survival of his ancestral art form and, and the traditions uh, of, this, uh, of this art. And he uses his ancestral dyeing techniques and the materials and weaving tools to create actually a conversation and an interaction with the contemporary art world. So I think it's uh, good to have Porfirio as our next speaker now. Porfirio, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Ilsa. Thank you. 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 Thank um, I hope my uh, presentation could give some context to this topic that we've been talking about, very interesting topic. And I would also like to share how um, uh, migration has played a big role into it, the enrichment of my culture, but also what migration means to um, in the indigenous of the Americas context. This is all through my personal journey and through my work, of course. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen right now. Let's see here. Again, I am. I was born and raised in Teotitlan del Valle in Oaxaca, Mexico, or what is now known as Oaxaca, uh, in, in Mexico, about 200 miles southeast of Mexico City. Uh, my ancestors has been uh, living, inhabited in this part of the Americas for um, at least 10,000 years. I was born and raised being part of this uh, syncretism culture, this um, way of being and uh, understanding the world through the indigenous and ancestral way of uh, um, living with it and understanding it as well as through uh, what the Spanish brought to us. And this is done through uh, different, or this is seen through obviously different ceremonies, beliefs, um, uh, through dancing, uh, the meaning of day of the dead and the spiritual aspect of it the blessing of the food um, and the, the roles of colors, specifically the cochineal insect. I was born and raised in a uh, family of musician, practitioners of feather and teacher, the ceremony feather dancing. My father has been a weaver, weaver <clears throat> since a very young age, as well as farming. My mother's a spinner and also a practitioner of um, the traditional medicine or healer. So I was born and raised uh, by these two amazing artists, which are my first teachers. And I, understand, I understood that since a very young age, uh, the benefit of plant and nature and the role that it plays within the arts, but also in the medicine world. So not so much as a color when it comes to plant. I am part of a, a, a generation of diaspora when it comes to uh, migration. Um, the need of human being to uh, begin a journey in their life, either economic opportunity or just a need of spiritual understanding and enrichment. This obviously has happened throughout human history. And I am uh, an, uh, an example of that. So I migrated to United States when I was 12 years old. And throughout these um, experiences of migration, 
uh, I guess I could say it, that I gained my independency from my own culture. And I think the enrichment of my work and the opportunity to discover and rediscover the importance of my art as a, as a weaver have been through this migration. I returned to my community about eight years or 10 years after I had migrated. And only through this um, time of silence, I discover my calling, or as my mother said, that the greater being blessed my hand for, for a specific work that I need to do here in this world. I discovered that by being absent from, um, from this art practice. And um, only through that, I came to um, resume my art practice, uh, first established my, uh, my studio in Oaxaca, my first studio, this is 15 years ago. And most recently, I, I uh, established, established uh, a studio here in Ventura where I have been living for the last 24 years. This time of silence enabled me to um, value the ancestral natural diet tradition. As growing up, this tradition was already depleted and extinct in our community. And uh, I could safely say uh, in Mexico, there was overall as a country, very few, uh, very few people maintain the knowledge of natural dyeing. But in my community, I did not know of anybody that continued to use natural dyes. So I was really drawn uh, by um, understanding the chemistry, the science that nestle within the traditional knowledge. And those are some of the things that I wanted to bring to my work. And of course, uh, find a way that I could continue to express as an individual and use the same medium as my ancestors used to be able to express a worldview. Earlier, I mentioned that um, that the independency from my own culture enabled me to enrich in my journey as an artist. And I say that not in a, uh, a way of disrespecting my own culture, but when you are part of a culture, you are often um, boxed in a um, context or in a way of thinking of doing things and, and, and as, as well as being oppressed by institution, by a market, by the world that's often uh, is expecting you to be a certain way, to, for you to dress a certain way. Uh, often all these uh, things that um, pushes the culture to be seen as folklorized or as romantic, romantic, romanticized, um, the narrative that we can still see, especially for those of you that might have visited Oaxaca. There's so much of that continue to happen, obviously that serves a purpose, right? Even within our community, we tend to do that because of the benefit sometimes to make a sale and so forth. So by gaining my independency from my own culture has free me in some sense to be able to be part of a larger community around the world who is interacting with not only our tradition and culture and communities, but also the wider world, the, the, the contemporary or the more urban um, in this case, more urban America here in Southern California, the influences uh, of what my finds has been here in Southern California has obviously start begin to enrich my work and um, begin creating a conversation around uh, not only uh, the traditional practices and materials, but also reinterpreting traditional symbols, techniques and materials and begin to uh, honoring and recognize and valuing also the urbanism, the minimalism, uh, specifically in my work. One of the things that has influenced my work tremendously is the, um, the discovering in my end for um, California modernism. So that start to create a, a very interesting conversation into further shaping my, my identity as a craftsperson, but also as a um, um, indigenous Zapotec at the same time as a, uh, you know, Californian. I started to create a conversation and my most recent work, it's are the images that I'm, I'm, I'm showing here. These are framework 
um, that are obviously continue to be woven on a um, traditional loom with traditional technique of dyeing by creating these conversation uh, in the contemporary art world. And um, also uh, questioning more, much more than, than, than just creating beautiful objects or design beautiful elements, creating a conversation or asking questions is um, what it's a, a, a migration, the meaning of migration and the diaspora and also the enrichment that happens through this diaspora. But at the same time, um, asking these questions in a indigenous of the America context. So this body of work that I'm showing here, um, it's, it's titled Continuous Line. And the idea uh, or the conversation started uh, by asking my position um, as an immigrant indeed in this modern society, but also what does that mean when I'm also Native American, um, that this land has been um, inhabited uh, for, uh, for thousands and thousands of years by indigenous people, and one of them is the Zapotec people. That the border obviously became to be much later in life that uh, when I meditate about this, I have nothing to do with that. Um, I think about it as Mexican perspective. Well, I'm not even Mexican to begin with, nor I am, you know, American uh, as we call it, United States. Instead, I'm, I'm a Zapotec. So those are my principles and those are my values. So um, these questions um, continue to happen. I, I, or I ask these questions because um, we often think that the culture stays on the other side of the border, that tradition stays on a specific place of origin, in this case in Oaxaca. And we don't think of traditions and crafts. I hear somebody speaking in the background. I think they can mute the the, um, thank you. Um, so uh, I often think that, that the tradition um, um, flows through people. In fact, I don't just think about it. I know exactly that, I, I know that's what it is because I live it uh, myself um, as a Zapotec from Mexico, um, is that we often forget that our, our head is our house and that tradition flow, flow, flows through the people where life takes them, where they go. And um, the tradition, it just innovates. It, it, it preserves in some aspect, but it innovates and it survives. It prepares for the future. It get, it, it's, in, in, it's enriched by the experiences. Um, and um, it continues, in, in specifically my work, continues to look into um, the traditional symbols that my ancestors, my father, my grandparents used, specifically um, grecas, as we call it in Spanish, uh, that are found on the walls of Mitla, which I have a picture in the next few slides here, um, as a reference to that. Um, continue to be obviously by, be my reference as an artist, but so much of it is obviously um, simplify in a way that speaks uh, the language in a much more contemporary environment. Bert, I don't know if you could mute. Uh... Sorry? I hear a lot of background, uh, someone ah. speaking, I don't know if... Uh... Uh, I don't hear it, I'll check whether, whether every microphone is muted. Okay, thank you. And, um, and also um, to addressing the, um, this notion of folklorism, this notion of uh, the textiles um, of, of being a folk car, I, I really started to think about also the way of presenting to work, not only uh, creating a body of work that engages a more conce conceptual uh, expression, but instead is how the work is being presented. That's the idea of framing the work. So that way, um, hopefully it can continue and further engage conversation in the contemporary art world. And so that way textile could be, again, in this case, to be redefined again, as this textile was used, first of all, 
historically within the community for the community um, as a garment or an enredo, um, a skirt like <clears throat> for everyday use and for ceremonies. But then later on, when tourists started to arrive and discover Oaxaca, this is <clears throat> 1940s, 50s and early 60s, we start to see a much more presence of tourism and that's how this weaving became to be known as rugs and as we know it today. So um, how the innovation and the continued thinking about how this art can continue to be relevant in, 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 in present day, it is just another way or another opportunity to redefine the use of these traditional textiles. This is an image of one of the most important and sacred ceremonial site of the Zapotec people. This is just right outside of our community. This is in Oaxaca. And we could see, and Glenn mentioned this briefly earlier, is um, the abstract work. And uh, I could point in the most recent years with Joseph and Annie Alberts, spend so many times, so much time in Oaxaca looking at the uh, uh, ancient art and the abstraction that they found within that that environment. Um, those are uh, my inspiration as a contemporary textile artist, but also the reference of the minimalism and the influence that those conversations had in, especially in the California modernism. And the, <clears throat> we see it here. And, and for me, it has obviously played a big role within creating and being able to hopefully um, my work to be uh, respected in this environment of contemporary and present vocabulary. Um, other work that I have been working on within a series that engages the movement and the need of people, I mentioned earlier of migration, specifically through my experience, but also Overall, as historic, uh, historically, people has had the need to, to move and, and uh, be, um, um, or migrate and be part of migration and movement of humanity of, of being uh, overall, like also the monarch butterflies, I think about it so much. So I started to engage this conversation much more deeper within my work. So the, 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 this piece is actually, um, it's what Glenn was talking about earlier in the exhibition um, at the Arts and Industry Building at the Smithsonian. So this is a piece that was woven in a, in a traditional loom. Then it was dyed afterwards with indigo, but the design was added with the needle felting technique, which is ab absolutely not traditional to the Zapotec culture. But I really wanted to engage this conversation and uh, because it is also a reminder um, and how uh, indigenous people uh, live their culture today, where they live it and, and, and the importance of innovation. And um, so this body of work uh, talks about the movement, the, the spirit and also the spiritual journey in our culture. We believe when someone passes uh, the need and the importance of a journey, uh, the spirit from earthly world and the world into the spirit world and comes back and visit us during Dia de los Muertos or Day of the Dead celebration. Um, and this is a, um, a work that for me, it is not focused so much on just like the traditional work that it's valued by the material and timing. Instead, I start to think about this work and the value of the work of the conceptual understanding and uh, how they could also be relevant and, and uh, into um, contemporary art world or design. Other works that I have created, looking into uh, cultural objects like a petate, a palm leaf mat that has been woven and some of the remnants or uh, fragments that has been found in Oaxaca that dates back to 6,000 years. Uh, these pieces uh, has been used in traditional uh, or in everyday life, but also in ceremonies. It was uh, used not too many generations ago, uh, was used in, as a shroud. But these are objects um, or conversation that I often find very interesting, but yet it could also be looked, uh, very abstract. This is another 
design that looks into um, rich. This is um, a body of work that, that I call rituals, but by yet it's it's quite um, represents the contemporary language of today. And of course, when it comes to um, artesanía in this case or craft, uh, specifically looking into uh, Mexican artesanía sector, we often see it, see it as a less value and because maybe because it's a utilitarian object or a ceremonial object for many, many cultures. Uh, my work also looks into and has the root into the utilitarian objects, of course. Um, so the next few slides that I'm gonna show, it looks into the design aspect, not so much in the art aspect of it, but into the design aspect that these pieces are utilitarian. These pieces can be used as rugs. And, uh, but yeah, it looks in the aesthetic of, um, of the design itself and continue to create this conversation of my journey and findings here in much more urban American, Southern California, and also the ancestral land and, and traditions in Oaxaca. Um, these elements continue to be traditional. This particular design that you look at your screen here, it is a very traditional design that's used indeed as bands, which much more with much more uh, designs. So it looks very complex. But for me, it continues to be, I have that soul, not only to the natural diet tradition or the symbolic elements, but yet a way that it simplifies things that you could focus on one element and hopefully um, the appreciation could come in a very simple way. <clears throat> the material is obviously plays such an important role in these pieces. Uh, so many of my work in this particular one that you're looking at your screen, it's made with just natural sheep color. So it's not dyed. Uh, instead, it looks into the movement of the raw material and create depth and using this variation of the colors that comes from the sheep itself and create work that, um, that yet it conveys the past, but also enriches the present and makes it hopefully valuable to the audience of today. And of course, um, continue to think about not only innovating through the design itself, but also um, a product when I think of it as a, um, a craft, uh, how that this type of work continue to um, create an interest within a, a market. Um, and I recently start to engage uh, bags and look into how these, how these uh, traditional blankets could be used as bags. So I created this collection of work that, um, that it could continue to be relevant and, and could provide a different uh, purpose for it. When I think about tradition, when I think about migration, again, I think about uh, I think about and focus much more on the land itself. So my work, uh, it is driven by the land and so much of these um, answers of these questions uh, comes from the plants itself. So, so many of the plants that it's somewhat or what we think of being indigenous to Oaxaca has also been uh, grown here in Southern California where I live for who knows how many thousands of years or hundreds of years, or they might have been also be indigenous here as well. So when I focus on, on, on the plants itself, that's where my answers are that these, these, the, the nature and the land, uh, if I find the elements here, then my work could also live here. And, and could also be uh, relevant to this part of uh, the Americas. And that's just a reminder for me, um, is my role within the Americas, especially in this country as United States, but also the role, of my, uh, the role that my work plays when it comes to migration. In so many cases, it is just a reminder of that I'm just moved a couple blocks north from my house. I'm still on the same land, 
and I can understand that through the plants uh, that I use for the colors. Thank you, thank you, Berth, uh, for the invitation and uh, for all of you for for uh, the opportunity. You're muted, uh, Berth. You're muted. Yeah, <laughs> I was saying I, I forgot to, to mute myself apparently. Um, so I was the disturbing factor in your uh, in your talk. I was the the reason behind the noise. So I first forgot to unmute uh, to mute myself, and then I forgot to unmute myself. So, <laughs> but thank you, thank you. This was a very nice, uh, very nice uh, talk. Uh, I suggest to do it as we did it um, with Mark and Glenn, uh, that we first move to the next speaker and then uh, collect questions. Uh, again, you can all already put your questions in the chat. I, I see one uh, question still unanswered to Glenn, for example. Feel free to answer it already, Glenn. We'll see what uh, how many time we have left afterwards to have, have additional questions but use the chat uh, in the meantime. Um, but let us first now move to um, Lise van Assen. Um, Lise is a, a, a Flemish, uh, so socially engaged artist and a, co a costume designer, a social designer and a documentary director as well. And she's also the instigator and the driving force behind Duke. And Duke is a is a, a textile platform, uh, I think, for a diverse community of designers, artists, craftspeople, makers, and researchers. And the idea is to build a bridge with that platform between craft and the public sphere. And in her talk, Lise will explore and, and try to think about the ways in which we attribute value to crafts. Um, it's at, again at the heart of the of what we try to do today, and and she will try to uh, think about developing different and innovative ways, specifically of embedding crafts in the city. So, uh, Lise, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Beth. Um, I will open my shared screen. Please think about the time, but because we have yeah. uh, we have already. I'm not, I'm, I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, one second. Okay, I think everybody can see now the the screen. Bert. Uh, yes, it yeah. works perfect. Okay. Yeah. Then I can go see ahead. Thank you very much also for the invitation um, to be here. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Duke and uh, how it, uh, it was started. Um, Duke is a Flemish word for canvas, um, like, uh, but we have a, a network that calls canvas, so it's strange to call it canvas. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I, I call Duke a textile platform for creating new forms and rules um, because it's not about um, a platform to make to, to be together uh, only out of crafts, but I, it will be clear when I talk further. So when the, I'm now trying to move, oh, okay, I'm too fast. So these are a few, um, pictures there, so it's located in uh, the city of Antwerp. Um, and uh, here is a picture of a atelier uh, we did in the Mass Museum. Um, and these are also pictures of that. How Duke started? It started as a social artistic atelier for refugees uh, with a special uh, talent in textile. And I started it as a so as a costume designer because I wanted to um, do something 
uh, about uh, a societal problem. Um, that is, there is not a lot of solidarity in between uh, different communities in that city. And the city of Antwerp, uh, we have 176 different um, community and different nationalities. So, uh, and there is a big distance between these people. Um, and then you have um, a lot of people who come from other countries with a lot of textile talent um, in their hands, in their, and, uh, in their heart and in their head. And of course, if you come to Belgium, there are they, you cannot do anything with your textile craft uh, as a profession, as a, as a way of uh, earning your money as your work. So I got a few people uh, who I met and they asked me, can I work for you? And uh, yeah, it's a pity, but like um, hand embroidery in, a, in Antwerp, there is no um, market for it. So I started thinking, okay, this is so beautiful what, what um, people show me from other countries, but they brought, and I said something, okay, we need to do something with it, but because you have, on the other hand, uh, all the, the crafts and the, the, the knowledge is going away uh, because of the relocation, for, because of the production in other countries. But also as a, as a, myself as an artist and designer, I, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to connect with uh, these crafts. So this is a way to reconnect with crafts that are almost disappeared in Belgium. Um, and, that's, and so I thought, oh, how can I do it? How can I mix the, the, the two things I, that are for me very important? Um, sustainability, but also um, developing your talent um, and this doing in a super diverse urban context. Fun. So I, I think I thought about uh, making tools and tools for me are the way um, I find it's uh, the most easy to, to, to connect and to, to, to search uh, for connection with uh, in between people. Um, the most important thing about these tools I want to do is that um, um, is that it's a way of connecting. So uh, the first tool I uh, I made was called uh, Ontmoetings Atelier. Uh, I tried to explain it in uh, in English, uh, Encounter Atelier, but it's a little bit um, strange to say it like that. Uh, but um, yeah because it's the atelier is about first is about uh, encountering each other and the second thing is about doing something together but uh, for me the, the encounter is more important than the than the than the learning uh, from the learning crafts then you have the collective wisdom sessions i will explain later and the textile blind dates so it's also about crafting a community itself, a community that doesn't exist uh, yet in, uh, in Antwerp. It's the community, I call it, I use sometimes the word community of practice, because there are a lot of uh, knowledge from people who don't know each other, uh, in, for instance, in embroidery. So this is like a sort of Ontmoetings Atelier, it's just a, I bring people together who are normally not used to meet each other. And, uh, and then we try to find ways to interconnect. Then, uh, this is also, also we did, um, oh, sorry, workshops with children. And then you had to also like that there's lace making that is, um, that is also that, there, that you have a lot of different textile skills children can pass on from uh, one hand is uh, Afghan embroidery and, the, and then the next day they do um, uh, uh, lace making, etc. Then, um, so I want to talk a little bit more about the uh, encounter ateliers. The each encounter for me is, it starts with that the participant shares a textile object 
a personal textile object uh, where there is a, a story on connected and a story that they want to share with um, the other people. Um, and in that way, we have a sort of, uh, we bound a little bit with each other. Uh, and then the ne next step is to show what you are busy with, just uh, your textile talent, your textile craft, uh, what you do. And in this way, the, 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 the conversation started. So it's very um, inclusive, very, um, uh, and, and the idea of that is it's a sort of performance in the outside, in the public space, so that people who are uh, not participating or that they, people who pass through, that they also can discover what we do as a sort of open format for textile. The collective wisdom sessions are a sort of more shared dialogue around uh, one uh, topic that is an instigator is um, making. It can, for instance, uh, past year we did one around um, uh, passement. I don't know the word in English. It's a technique where you made the cords and uh, like the cords for curtains and things like that. Um, so there is a lot of people who came together to talk about that subject, how some old craft that's almost disappeared, how we can revitalize, uh, revitalize it to uh, a modern sort of uh, uh, craft. So there's also, this is more like dialogues. The other one is more like doing, and this is more like sort of dialogue. Um, we also try to do in this dialogue that it goes to sort of co-creation or sort of, it doesn't have to, to have a, a, um, a solution. It's really like a dialogue in, in knowledge sharing and um, looking for new ways to um, deal with uh, your practice. Um, it's also important that we, because we have a div very, very diverse group from people who are analphabetic and brothers until uh, researchers, so that there is a moderator who helps to create a, a safe space for everybody, so that everybody can talk, um, and also people who are too shy that they have they have a sort of we, we have a system uh, where where everybody can uh, easily talk and share their opinions of experiences. Then uh, another way I did it was the textile blind date dates. Uh, that was in Corona time. Then uh, we couldn't do the uh, Antmutting ateliers, so I'm I we uh, I matched. I asked people, okay, do you want to meet other people uh, with your textile? We also as textile craft, and so I got a lot of um, eighty or nineteen um, people who want to join us in uh, Flanders, and then uh, I matched them. So I made matches of duos, and then they could have a textile blind, blind date. This was uh, interesting to, to do it in this way. Of course, it was Corona. Um, and it's, it's nice to, to do this. Uh, in the future, I want to do it more, but on also on international with international connections and matching. So we'll see, that's a, a new. So it's all about um, the, the, the making solidarity and, and making tools to, that people can communicate about what they are doing. Um, then I had a community art project I did this summer. I started this summer and um, as for me as a person, uh, as, as, as an artist, and it's called Invitation for Everybody. Um, and the, it's about, I started, it started with, with the research I did around the emotional meaning of personal textile objects. And I did a research where I questioned whether textile objects can create connections in a city through their emotional value. 
And from that on, uh, I first uh, developed the uh, Ontmoetings Ateliers and I experimented with that. And then from that on, this other project started. And I asked people to come and tell um, a textile story uh, of, of the city, a place in the city, a public place in the city uh, where they have a connection with. And this connection, they uh, get an, a sort of tablecloth and there on that of, um, of, a, of the at a canvas where the, uh, the city map is uh, made on. And on that canvas, they can embroider that place in the city. We started in Middleham Museum this summer. So uh, it's an open air uh, museum uh, where there are a lot of um, uh, statues and, and, and uh, and this is one example. So this is a part of the city of Antwerp. And uh, it's also the contours. And, and so we have 148 uh, pieces of cloth where you have all streets and parks and everybody can decide for themselves which part of the city they want to fill in. In this way, uh, everybody is also uh, uh, artist or craftsman or whatever you want to call yourself of this project and 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 everybody else uh, is going to also be recognized as co-artist of this project we started it oh sorry goes to quick so these are the 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 curt yeah the cloths and this in this way we are now continuing doing uh, the few years to come with this project around uh, museums, but also like uh, in a place where um, a few uh, people who are uh, blind people are. So because in this way we can make sort of square and we can make a line around uh, one neighborhood and they can fill it fill it in their, themselves. So. Um, this is, um, yeah, oh yeah, and then one last picture. So this is what I wanted to talk about. Voila, thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. Thanks again for the very inspiring talk. Um, this is also very, very close to what we wanted to, to achieve, I think, in terms of inspiration. Um, I see already questions popping up in the chat, which is good, but I suggest to move first. Can you um, stop sharing? Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, sorry. Um, let's move first to uh, Lisa, Lisa Sorel, who is a master boot maker. Uh, Lisa is a, a fine artist as well, but specialized in the traditional Cowboy boot, and in 1969, I think she founded the enterprise Custom Boots in uh, in Guthrie, Oklahoma, which I think she still runs at the present day. And in her talk, she will focus on the rationalis and logics behind teaching traditional crafts. If I'm not mistaken, Lisa, I, I think I saw you already in the list of particip in participants, so I think you're here. Or not? <laughs> ah, sorry, uh, Mayor, I was wait. I was waiting for you to unmute me. I apologize. Ah, sorry, sorry. Oh, I, <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> I didn't realize that was me. I needed to do that. Okay, uh, hello no everyone. Hi. I'm I'm Lisa Sorrell, and as Bert said, I'm a cowboy boot maker, and I was born in 1968, so I didn't start my business in 1969. <laughs> I started it in 1996. But anyway, I want to talk to you today about the benefits of learning a craft and the value of heritage and tradition. First, though, let me tell you about how I learned to be a cowboy bootmaker and where I am in my craft journey now. 
So I found cowboy boot making by answering an ad in the local newspaper searching for someone to stitch cowboy boot tops. I had no idea what that meant and I'd never worn cowboy boots. I was very fortunate though, because that ad was placed by a legendary bootmaker who could trace his heritage directly back to the pioneers of the American cowboy boot. And therefore I can now say the same thing about my own work. So there are all sorts of definitions and explanations for the word craft, and we've covered some of them today. And I'm going to be adding my own opinions to that lexicon. I personally don't believe that craft or a particular tradition or branch of craft must stay the same forever. But I do believe that craft should be rooted in innovation and not invention. Innovation is based on tradition. It begins in a thorough immersion in the history and the heritage of what you're making, influenced by your own ideas, your own preferences, access to materials, and the time period in which you live. Innovation allows for change. Invention, on the other hand, begins in the imagination. It's a starting point. Innovation is good, invention is good, but in my opinion, invention isn't craft because craft is more than just creating an object. Craft is knowledge. Let me give you an example. 30 years ago, when I first saw that ad in the newspaper, I could have said, oh, cowboy boots look interesting. I'm going to start making cowboy boots. I'd been making clothing since I was 12 years old, and I was familiar with patterning and textiles. I probably could have sat down and thought deeply about how cowboy boots were shaped and the function in the form of cowboy boots and how to achieve that. And perhaps I could have made something cowboy boot shaped but there would have been so many things lacking in my cowboy boot shaped thing. Not just a knowledge of the history and tradition, but also an awareness of the best materials and tools and expertise required to choose the materials or hold the tools correctly and the understanding of the function it was all supposed to perform. Speaking of tools, I'm going to take a little detour here and talk about the importance of having proper tools because as a craftsman, I love tools. There's a quote from Philip Pullman that I particularly like. It says, the intentions of a tool are what it does. A hammer intends to strike, a vice intends to hold fast, a lever intends to lift. They are what it is made for. But sometimes a tool may have other uses that you don't know. Sometimes in doing what you intend, you also do what the knife intends without knowing. Each craft has its own unique tools developed through years of history and mastery to perform all of the steps required. Could I use a pair of regular old pliers from the hardware store to last a pair of cowboy boots? Probably if I had to, but they're the wrong tool and they would never teach me anything. If I search for and purchase a nice pair of lasting pliers, which is the tool designed for that task, I won't only have the tool to do the job well, the tool itself, because it's designed for that particular task, the tool will guide me and teach me as I do that work. The lasting pliers are my tool, but they're also my teacher. Choosing the right tools for your craft, respecting the right tools for your craft, is a way of surrendering to the history of your craft. Tools are important because craft is technique and motion and movement. The correct tool enhances and guides the motion, encouraging it rather than impeding it. So craft is more than just creating an object. Craft is knowledge. Invention is an idea, but it's kind of redundant to invent something that already exists. If you find a craft that interests you, respect it enough to learn that craft before you begin changing it. Innovation is taking the knowledge and moving your craft forward or adding your own flair to it. The title of my presentation is Being a Stepping Stone to the Future. And honestly, it took me a while to understand and embrace my role in the craft of cowboy boot making. When I first began learning boot making, it was simply a cool new craft that fascinated me. As I devoted myself to learning it and realized the complexities, I became very focused on doing it right and making sure everyone else did it right too. 
it's only now after 30 years that I've been able to step back and take an honest look at myself and my work and my craft, its history and what I can add to it. When I refer to myself as a stepping stone, it's because I want to be a bridge from the past to the future. I don't want to be an isolated island of invention, trying to devise a totally new version of something that already exists. But I also don't want to be a fortress of rules, insisting that deviations from tradition are never allowed. And now, if we're lucky, we will look at some pictures of what I'm trying to convey. All right, these, there are two pairs of cowboy boots in this image. The one on the left has an inlaid butterfly design and the one on the right has inlaid eagles. Keep in mind that every color you see is a different piece of leather, there's no painting. There really isn't any written documentation about the history of decorative work on cowboy boot tops, but one assumes that cowboys who spent much of their life outdoors preferred images from nature. This may be one explanation for a strong history of eagles and butterflies as traditional cowboy boot designs, but there's another explanation that had to have been a factor. A cowboy boot typically has a front panel and a back panel with a side seam joining them. At the top, there's a scallop that dips down, and at the bottom of the, of the panel, there's a tongue that comes up into the panel. This creates sort of an H shape. The outspread wings of a butterfly or an eagle work well in this space. Years ago, did some cowboy request an eagle because he saw one flying above him and felt the yearning for the freedom of flight? And did the bootmaker who created the design think, huh, this, this fits the space so much better than the turtle I did last week? We'll never know the answer to that question, but as a teacher, I can tell my students, think about the space that you're designing in. The traditional designs were popular because they filled that space well. Here's another example of a skillful way to work within the shape of a cowboy boot top. Floral designs were also popular. They stay within the theme of nature and flowers can be twined around and manipulated to fit any shape. People sometimes view flowers as feminine but vintage cowboy boots never imposed gender rules on cowboy boot designs. Butterflies, flowers, bright colors, all of those were traditional and were not considered to be masculine or feminine. Learning the design history of cowboy boot making hasn't limited me. I've done plenty of very non-traditional designs, but it did teach me about how to use space and color. That is the wrong image. Okay, as an example, here's a couple of cowboy boots I've made with non-traditional designs. The Satanist real boots are not making a religious statement. They commemorate an iconic 1959 gospel album by the Lubin brothers and an influential duel in cowboy boot in country music. The boot, was commission, the boot with the standing figures was commissioned by a movie director to reference a film that he had done. And even here, you can see my knowledge of how to work with leather reflected in these images, because if you think about it, faces and eyes are very difficult to convey with the art of leather inlay and overlay and stitching. And so these figures are represented from the back so I didn't have to worry about faces. So I love cowboy boots and it took me a long time to use my own background as my personal stepping stone to something new and even then I've returned to the past as a gateway to the as my own gateway to the future. This is what I've been playing with recently. In the wartime years of the 1940s leather was scarce and bootmakers began making shorter cowboy boots. Some bootmakers even tried making cowboy boot shoes because they used less leather. So if you go back to this period, that's when really short cowboy boots started and those are called peewees, but some bootmakers started making shoes. Recently, I've switched almost completely to making cowboy boot oxfords. 
Remember that H-shaped cowboy boot top I mentioned a minute ago? Now with the shoes, suddenly my design space is totally different. And I'm once again finding myself intrigued and challenged and frustrated and fulfilled. And that, of course, is one of the points of craft. One of the objects of craft is to fulfill you and challenge you and make you happy and sad all at the same time. So I also began playing with new stitching techniques and I appear to have accidentally created something totally new. For these projects, I stitched the negative space between the elements to create the design. I don't think anyone's ever done this before. This is an idea that arose from years and years of hand, at least haven't done it before on leather, let's put it that way. This idea arose from years and years of handling a sewing machine and observing how stitching changed the surface of the leather. Conveying light and shadow using only leather and stitching is difficult. And on the cowboy boots pictured here, the ones with the purple, I was attempting to, attempting to mimic the effect of light coming through a stained glass window. Not sure if I succeeded, but it was sure fun to try. All right, devoting yourself to a particular craft doesn't mean forsaking all modern ideas and materials. I use synthetic thread in places that a bootmaker 100 years ago would have used linen or silk. Those threads were susceptible to rot and synthetic threads are not. Practicing a craft also doesn't mean you must limit yourself to its historic users. I haven't made very many boots for working cowboys and not many of my boots have gotten near a horse. True craft is not a static, fixed, unchanging series of steps. It's innovation and growth and movement, but it's growth that's built upon a foundations of technique that worked and worked well. As a craft person, I feel a tremendous sense of responsibility to link the past and the future, to convey the bedrock of cowboy boot making, while at the same time granting future boot makers the space to continue to innovate. Tradition does not threaten the future of craft. It gives it a solid base on which to build. Hey, thanks, Lisa. That was uh, inspiring and powerful as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the three speakers. I think, uh, well, we are a bit behind schedule, but uh, I would suggest to have some uh, questions nevertheless. Um, I didn't see a question in the chat, except for one for references, I think. So who wants to enter into discussion or and an additional question. Don't see. Bert, otherwise. Yeah, Liz, go ahead. I just want to uh, to explain to Marie Noel Grison that um, what what I do is. Uh, I, I invent this, I design these tools because I see a need to do so. And it's, a, and because I bring uh, the, 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 so it's not, a, I don't have references <laughs> in that way. We are just doing it and we're just experimenting with these tools and, and, and looking for ways how they work and then, and, and then change them and then do it again and things like that. So uh, voila, it's a little bit my answer. Yeah, and there's a bit of a follow-up question now, I think, from Isabel. I, I saw the question, you want me to go ahead. Um, the question was, can tools be the invention? And that's definitely true. I have all sorts of tools in my shop that I've, I've thought about. I need something to do this particular technique. Let's invent something. So sometimes, yes, you can invent a tool, which is, a very powerful feeling. Tools, it, it's a, a mutual relationship where the tool is teaching you and you're inventing the tool and uh, tools are just really wonderful. <laughs> Don't see other hands. I had actually a, a, a question myself perhaps. It's, 
when, when it comes to invention, do you experience a, a, a difference between invention of inno or innovation, innovation aspect, especially, I think. And it's a, a question actually to the three of you, I guess. Uh, do you experience a difference between invention in terms of techniques and invention in terms of, or innovation in terms of techniques and innovation in terms of uh, design? Is that, is, that this, is that similar when it comes to dealing with your tradition and being confronted with the, the challenge to innovate? Or is it perhaps easier to innovate in terms of design than in terms of techniques? Or would you be more inclined to in, innovate in that direction than in terms of techniques? I'm, I'm, I just wonder, it's an, an entirely open question. Uh, I can yeah. say something about it, Beth. Yeah. If you see him in textile, of course, then is there is now a lot of innovation in material to um, because the, the this is one of the most uh, um, polluting uh, yeah, craft you can imagine in, in textiles for this moment, and this, so there is a lot of in, innovation in. Uh, making new um, tissues. Uh, that's that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So, and in the design way, then of course it's like the circularity. That's of course a, a very uh, topic that this has to be um, be normal as a designer that you have to take care of it. And if I see it for me, what I do is like more like social innovation. So it's a lot. Of, it's another way of looking and I, I used the textile and the craft to, to have a source yeah. of social innovation. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. I, I, would, I would like to point out that there's there's possibly more room for innovation and invention in some other crafts, but footwear, uh, you can cripple someone if you just decide to strike off and do something unprecedented. And and so there are some some boundaries in footwear that don't necessarily exist in many other crafts. Okay, I can imagine that. Porfirio? Yes, definitely. I think innovation, it obviously goes hand to hand with technique. Uh, in my case, I don't focus on innovation. In, in, uh, all I focus on how to uh, <clears throat> focus on be able to communicate uh, what I have in mind and uh, a message uh, or something that I need to say um, through my work. So, uh, because as an indigenous person lives in 21st century in United States, that could obviously be seen, even if you look at me, you would think innovation. <laughs> Thanks. Enough. In the meantime, another a question from Stein Kulemans, I think, in the chat. Stein, can you unmute yourself, perhaps? Hello. Yeah. Um, I just had a question. Um, how does the creation of a masterpiece, uh, or how do uh, world fairs uh, contribute uh, to the arts and crafts. I'm thinking like, um, for instance, the Werkbund, um, they empowered the use of, uh, of glass and um, metal in architecture. I'm also thinking at, <laughs> which is maybe a real funny story, uh, the story of the uh, six um, fashion designers from Antwerp began with uh, fairs in Belgium, uh, which hadn't to do anything with fashion, but uh, with textile. Mm -hmm. So, do you get my question? Uh, no? So, Liz? Ah, it's me too. Okay. No, I, I, I was wondering the six of Antwerp, 
they they went to, yeah they they as a collective they went to Will Paris for to promote their no 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 before uh, that well before that when they um, completed their study uh, yeah. there was this prize winning award uh, the Harvard de Spoo. and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, when they uh, when one of the participants won the prize, they uh, uh, could uh, give their collection to uh, one Belgian uh, textile company, which produced uh, their um, their uh, collection. Yeah, yeah. And this was mainly because uh, we haven't got any tradition of fashion in Flanders. Uh, you and we have a tradition about textile so for instance someone like walter van berendonk he could uh, bring his collection to Bart, bartsons which was a company which made um uh clothes for uh, yeah, working people <laughs> with so i'm thinking about uh, how can some uh, some of these fairs stimulate the uh, arts and crafts by presenting uh, collections of designers, by uh, giving them prizes and uh, put it uh, on the show? Is it a question for me, Stan? No, it's in no, general. Just, yeah. So who wants to who wants to uh, go into that? Mm. It's it. Yeah. I can I can continue in it in in it a little bit. Yeah. Um, of course, you had before. I know the goddess pool. I was forgot. I forgot it already. Thank you, Stan. Um, and of course, you have the confection, but the confection in the 70s, yeah, that started already in Belgium uh, anyway. But you have, you have the avant-garde fashion, of course, that started later. Um, so do you have a difference between before and after the 60s? There's a big gap, of course. Um, then you have, of course, Dries van Otto is really into craft and what goes to India for to, to make it. I think crafts can have an important role in the ecosystem of fashion in Antwerp, uh, the way I do it, because it can be the inspiration for uh, young designers. Because if you, if if I was young, I was inspired because I was around textile, and because I saw it, I could be inspired. If I wouldn't be that in that environment, you could you yeah. It's, it's also something like um, that you think that passes uh, through also not only the craft, but also the, the love for crafts and not only the craft on itself. So if that disappears, um, that you can see somebody doing something out of the ecosystem in Antwerp, then you have also designers who are, um, think going to, to do it another do yeah you have to find your inspiration and 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 it's always uh, if it's really like tactile that you can touch it it's a very important thing for a designer for an artist mm -hmm. the tactile aspect of crafts but i can continue but i stop <laughs> about the tactile <laughs> okay yes, we are, yeah gradually running out of time but i have two questions in the chat and i would like to end with these two questions uh this this uh, session uh the first is from Evert yeah. for porfirio i think that's uh something interesting to uh to tackle Evert, can you perhaps pose your question briefly aloud just very shortly, do you hear me? Um, I was uh, I I, um, I was impressed by Porfirio's uh, presentation of uh, a craft and of an indigenous tradition and uh, an ancestral tradition that is being performed through passing through specific crafts and art. 
Um, on the other hand, you say that uh, crafts move through people and with people and through your through the heads of people. So that also means that uh, they, uh, um, of course, do influence and are appropriated everywhere and, and have influence and can be found uh, like uh, wreckage and like inspiration around the world and around the territory that uh, the Native Americans have once inhabited, etc., uh, etc. Et this sort of appropriation is uh, now sometimes framed as cultural appropriation and as something that cannot be appropriated by certain people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you do you have a, a position on that? Is that something that resonates with you, or is it not how you think about passing on crafts? Thank you for uh, your question. That is definitely, um, I, and it's very, very important. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in a big topic, especially in Mexico, uh, there has been several culture, clearly cultural appropriation through the indigenous garments that you find in Oaxaca and other parts of Mexico. There has been a lawsuit from the Mexican uh, cultural governments to some of these uh, designers that has clearly appropriate. And I think um, there's definitely a fine line where it's inspirational material or plain um, uh, appropriation. I think um, as human beings, we are enriched by um, experiences and things that we uh, come to um, to see, do, um, and, and, and especially for me as being having my foot in these two countries, um, I do find a tremendous amount of um, enrichment in the urban America here in the United States, but also finding the, such of a um, deep uh, way of being as ancestral uh, communities back home in Oaxaca. So I think uh, things that I find, especially here in, in Southern California, has been a source of inspiration and enrichment. And uh, in Oaxaca, in uh, Mexico, there's actually a law that um, any outsider designer um, that would like to work with the community, they have to ask permission to the entire community in order to work with the community member. Now, is that respected? Of course not. But that has definitely been a, a huge um, problem uh, because that comes with cultural exploitation, uh, labor exploitation of the community as well. With so many cases, the notion of helping, you know, so it has to also be with the integrity. I think it comes down to the individual's integrity, uh, how they would like to work with the community. And uh, I see these over and over. It has happened to me personally with some of my designs. And uh, this is obviously a, a, another uh, big subject to, to continue in talking about. Thanks, thank you. So Mark, you have the, the honor to have the last question for this first part of our workshop. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so this Lisa and portfolio, you're on my screen, uh, connected to each other. My question is, would, if I would propose that you would exchange houses uh, for a, a while or forever, what difference would that make? For, for instance, Lisa would make, if you move to Antwerp and open your shop, you would sell uh, a lot of boots and shoes, etc. Et because people would like it. Or at least if you move to uh, where Lisa lives or Porfirio, you could do the same because you're working on migration and Porfirio, your, what you make is also perfectly uh, on the market and it will be in exhibitions in that. So does location really matter? Is it a question of what Elizabeth also proposed of access to materials or to a public, but apparently cowboys and horses are not really needed for someone selling cowboy boots. So how flexible are you to uh, accept my proposition that you change houses and, uh, and just move to the other location? Or is location important in craft? I, I will answer. Um, I would say it would change my work maybe, but it might take some time. 
because I've talked a lot about heritage and tradition. So I would try to stay true to that. But at the same time, everything I make is commissioned. Everything you saw, someone came to me and said, I want this. And so the actual tradition was based upon those original cowboys who were working on the plains and coming to the bootmakers and saying, I want this. So if I moved to Belgium, perhaps my customers would influence where that tradition moves to and they would say, I want different things. Okay. Um, Jacob, that's an, uh, that's an incredible uh, question. And this is something that I've been trying to particular and address is, uh, Yes, indeed. Um, location when it comes to market does definitely influence to what are the things that could be sold. Like here in California, where my studio uh, is here in, in Southern California, I obviously sell more of my original design and contemporary design. And in the Southwest, I people purchase more of my traditional weavings. Um, but um, when I think about it as a way to enrichment, uh, it, it obviously, and I, that's what I'm trying to particularly, it's how the uh, experiences and um, places that you're, you, you move or you, you live in influences your work uh, that potentially enriches in what you do. Um, and that could obviously take a whole other um, a body of work that would be start to look into the environment where you at, where you live. And as for materials, my work can only be live where the dice plant, where the, these dye plants could be grown or uh, um, either farmed or actually um, uh, grows on the wild. So for instance, here in my studio, I actually farm in cochineal insect. This is an insect that breeds on prickly pear cactus. Um, this is the indigenous seed. So I can say these are the seeds of my ancestor because these insects were domesticated and those are the same insect that I'm using that has to do with climate. So they're only, their life, it's only possible um, depending on the climate. But since we're still on the Americas and the climate, uh, it still allows for them to grow and, and, and live and provide and eventually having the rat that I use for my, for, for my weavings Yes, it's, it's possible. And because of my work is driven by nature, as long as I'm within that, then it will be possible. At least you uh, want to add something? Yeah, I want to add something. Because what I, uh, I think por, uh, Porfirio, um, like in Belgium, we have also somebody who's busy with uh, coloring uh, out of um, uh, plants that are uh, normally in Belgium. So you have other plants in Belgium that give also the indigo color. So that you have, you could connect with. Um, if you, if I would invite you to Belgium, that, that you could get also plants, uh, but then in that location, of course, there is a difference for you, and it would be interesting maybe to 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 see what 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 where are the connections in between uh, because it, certainly with indigo it's around all the uh, the, the whole world and it is um, a lot of other plants, um, so it, it it's always um, for me it's crafting crafting communities but not the crafting community but the action of crafting communities making communities um so from that would be interesting also by seeing how much more is there outside of you to 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 find in your community and how you can can interact with other um other persons so, so like the idea of the the the, the um, atelier, the uh, Ontmoetings atelier, um, is something that I can do uh, anywhere, uh, on, on every location, I think, because I start from curiosity and I start from wanting to bring together around, and then the, the goal is to, to be, uh, not to make things, not make a product, but the community make the community so there's a different approach of course um i had also the idea 
when I was working with Nadia Moment, is an Afghan embroiderer, and I was her apprentice, and she was my master for two years in a, a, a master apprentice relationship we had in Belgium. And we thought also to do sort of uh, to start up meeting ateliers in Afghanistan uh, with uh, friends of her who were there. Um, but yeah, um, of course the situation is not so good there. So it's not, uh, it not happened until now, but maybe one day we'll do it. Um, and it's that the idea is that people yeah, come together around and learn and stay learning from each other outside a working atmosphere. So I would, uh, I would, it would be interesting to see, um, to, to have you uh, and uh, Lisa in Antwerp to see how we can connect. Mm -hmm. Will be an honor for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that seems like a good note to end uh, to end with. Uh, okay, uh, we have already consumed. Um, half of our break <laughs> uh, but i would suggest to nevertheless stick to the schedule have a brief break now of uh, 10 minutes and then start again at 10 40 for uh, who's in california and 90 40 for um, the continental european time so just a brief break now and then uh, in a few minutes, we start again with uh, other lectures.
Okay, I assume that most of us are back now. Um, the next uh, part is a bit different from the first in that the speakers are now um, most of all, I think, working in, in an institutional context about uh, crafts and very often, I think, at the interface between practitioners and on the one hand and policy making on the other hand. So we move to what I have called context and tools perhaps, but tools in a, in a more institutional sense. And our first speaker now is Jezebeth Tivascapo. And uh, she's program advisor and program director of the Popular Arts and Creative Industries program at the Institute of Puerto Rican culture in, in Puerto Rico, San Juan, Puerto Rico. And she will focus on the relationship between crafts on the one hand and creative industries on the other hand. And I think it will start from a reflection on why crafts are actually omitted in the definition of cultural industries in, in a document, in the document Puerto Rico Creative Industries Promotion Act. So, Jessabeth, I haven't talked to you before we started, but I hope you're here. Yes, I am. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, nice to meet you. <laughs> Thanks, me, go ahead. Everything great? I'm going to share a presentation I have. Um, here. Are you seeing it? Yes, okay. So, well, do I have to, um, do you already have my abstract? So I'm going to go like straight to the point and that way we don't, ah, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I had my headphones, but I, I didn't have them installed in the computer. So, <laughs> sorry, so now. <laughs> um, Hi to all of you. Thank you for this invite. Um, I'm not going to read my abstract since you already have it and I'm going to go straight to the point and that way we can just like start a, the conversation going. So um, as Bert said, I work with the Instituto of Puerto Rican Culture, Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña, and I'm going to talk about crafts and point arts as a creative industry. Um, the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture was created in 1955 to preserve, promote, enrich, and disseminate the Puerto Rican cultural values and achieve the bro broadest and deepest knowledge and appreciation of them. Since its creation, by the way, that photo was today, so you know we have a very great weather right now. <laughs> and um, since its creation in 1955. Uh, Dr. Ricardo Alegría, its first executive director, started investigating and gathering folk arts as part of creating a Puerto Rican cultural heritage collection. Um, at that time, Dr. Alegría was strongly criticized and publicly ridiculed for his appreciation of folk arts. Actually, at that time, when we see the congressional hearings or the legislative hearings of um, while creating, while enacting uh, the Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña este, Act, people even said that in Puerto Rico, there was no such thing as a Puerto Rican culture, so that the name of the institution should be, instead of Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña, which is Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, it should have been a Puerto Rican Institute of Cultures. And in that way, in Puerto Rico, people could study the cultures from the United States and Europe, which at the time was what was believed to be like really like culture. Um, but even though Dr. Ricardo Alegría uh, kept with his, you know, his, he had a very, amazing and como sería la palabra in English, uh, a very transgressive view at that time. And he started just gathering this amazing folk arts collection. We have a law in Puerto Rico that is called Act Number 166 of 1995, which 
de defines everything that it's trapped in Puerto Rico and actually defines the way that artisans can be certified by the government to perform their art, their art and to be able to work as, as artisans and even have some kind of tax reductions in the in that way when they sell they, their work. In that sense, the definition um, here you can you can read it, and it says that our crafts are an original work, fundamentally elaborated by hand, inspired by Puerto Rican cultural values, universal universal values, or personal experiences that reflects the artisan's design and creativity, with the use of local raw material as far as possible, and it cannot incorporate any commercial design aside those from the artisan's homes, you know? So in this definition, you already start to see some words, some concepts that really reflect with the uh, creative industry's definition nowadays, like original work, design, and creativity. Nowadays, we have over 25,000 certified artisans in the island and based on the Human Development Report uh, of Puerto Rico published in, 19, in 2018, sorry, the main cultural activities that Puerto Ricans carry out, not linked to, individ to individual media consumption, are attending craft fairs and purchasing folk arts. So here, craft fairs and folk arts are a big economic force. And this, you can see, this is this was um, our last massive uh, arts and crafts festival before the COVID-19 pandemic got us into lockdown. Actually, tomorrow we are going to have the next super massive uh, festival all around all San Juan. We have over 400 um, artists all around the, the world city. So, Tomorrow we will be again like having some kind of this, not like this, because we have like social distancing and masks and all that, but you know, we will be able again to have that feeling of really having um, people like just like enjoying culture and art and crafts in a big open space. But I want to use uh, Fiesta Cultural 2019 as an example of, the, of that economic force that I just said that uh, the crafts first and folk arts are in Puerto Rico. For that festival, ICP invested $42,777. And only with direct sales from the artisans that participated in the event, those sales amounted to almost half a million. So that's just like more than 10% um, in sales from what the state invested. And that um, we have to say, that this data is not complete since it doesn't include the 157,400 157, um, of sales from the visual artists that also participated in the event. And also the, we recollect the data Sunday, like early in the, in the morning, because if not, then people would just let go. And that day is one of the biggest um, sales the biggest things we have of sales in, in our fairs. So we know that actually the economic impact of this type of event is even higher than to say that it's 10 times the investment, the state investment. But it's a good uh, starting point to see it. For the past four years in ICP, we have been working in different strategies uh, to expand the sales outlets and economic performance of artisans affiliated with the institution. Some of those initiatives have been, for example, uh, marketing workshops for social media platforms like this one. We have an alliance with Brands of Puerto Rico that is a, a very important e-commerce platform that was created here in Puerto Rico, but it's already in Dominican Republic, Mexico, Panama, and, and soon it's going to be also in Chile. And in the case of Puerto Rico, it sells more to the Puerto Rican diaspora in the United States. And we have an alliance uh, so that our artisans or the artisans affiliated with us can have and sell their pieces throughout this e-commerce platform. We have also been offering artisans uh, the Project Cultural Factory, which is, a, is an entrepreneurship program ICP has. And in that, for about two to three months, 
um, in this case, artisans were having workshops in entrepreneurship, business development, marketing, marketing strategies, e-commerce, branding, business model uh, canvas, cost structures and price, pricing strategies, among other type of you know, in entrepreneurial and professional development workshops. Um, we also lanzamo, uh, what's the word of lanzar? Let me see. We also, I don't know. We also have a, a mobile app. I don't know the word lanzar. I just forgot about it. Like, I don't, I don't remember what's the exact word. But during the pandemia, we, it's not published, but we, we lanzamo. We have this new mobile app. It's called Artesanías ICP, where people can learn about arts and crafts, but also, well, our crafts and folk arts, but also they can look up any artisan based on their name or the type of product that they do. And they have like all their uh, contact information, their social media, and if that person also sells in any other platform like Etsy, eBay, or Brands of Puerto Rico, to name a few, you can also access that. And the, the idea is for artisans to be able to have this new uh, presence in order for them to have a new outlet of sales. During the pandemia, we also had the cultural fa factory, it was like called reinforcement, reinforcement. And that cultural factory, the idea was to reinforce knowledge about the different areas that we have already been working in some other cultural factories in terms of innovation, um, este, administration, financing, and all different aspects, not only to artisans, but also to some other different artists in like that work with ICT. Right now, we are actually working in amending Puerto Rico's incentive code in order for it to expand the sectors identified under the creative industries definition to include crafts and folk arts and shape the creation of creative districts around Puerto Rico, having artisans being part of that. So that's, this has been a process for about the last two years. Normally ICP has never worked with incentives nor like really economic development in the, in the island. It's not the, we have another state a state um, agency that is dedicated to that type of, of work. But in the last five years, we have been so, um, we have been very, um, I don't wanna say like, we, we have been working very hard to just like show the importance of, of the work of culture in economic development and actually of crafts and folk arts in all this new hype of the creative industries that, that we are seeing. Um, the next step is going to amend the, the Puerto Rico Creative Industries Promotion Act to include folk arts and cultural heritage. Right now, the, the language of this act already encompasses uh, the United Nations trade on um, definition of creative industries. And in a way it already like sets the arena for us to be able to include folk arts and crafts under this definition. But as of now, creative industries in Puerto Rico are, de are defined under, only under these sections. Design being that graphic, industrial, fashion, and interiors, arts, which is music, visual arts, performing, and publishing, media, meaning app development, video games, online media, digital content, and multimedia, and creative services, which are like architecture and creative education. As you can see in that definition, crafts, folk arts, and also cultural heritage are missing, um, and that's a big loss. To, for us, because it doesn't really reflect the diversity in our uh, creative economy ecosystem. So I, we think that this, we need to amend this law in order for, not, not only for people, but also for the government to really give full guards and crafts the, the importance that it needs. And, 
and actually being, be able to gather some new economic incentives and also to be able to be part of the creative districts that we are going to be creating all around the island. In Puerto Rico, so Puerto Rico is normally known for its artists. You know, like when people talk about Puerto Rico, they think about their music or, you know, like some big stars like Ricky Martin and now with the reggaeton, este, Bad Bunny and all that. But actually we have, we have a very lively uh, cultural scene and the folk arts and the craft fairs, as, as I just said before, are the biggest uh, cultural activity that Puerto Ricans uh, participate with. So this is a very um, big like economic scenario uh, for our artisans to be included and as seen as part of the creative industries. And here you can see some works of our artesanos. This is a Mascara de Vejigantes. Also, obviously, the, the Three Kings. And now I'm going to, we have been working in a series of short uh, documentals, documentaries from different artisans that, that um, create um, folk cards that are very from like difficult execution. And this is a little part, this is a little piece from one of those uh, interviews. I'm going to just like leave it with you. This um, interview is very important because that type of furniture is called Enea. Um, Enea, it's a vegetable fiber that it's uh, uh, located all around the island. And this type of, of work is very, this is the, uh, we call it Mueble Criollo, like Creole furniture. And what he's saying in this, in this part of the interview is that actually when he started doing this type of job, it was very hard for him to get customers, but nowadays it's become so popular that actually uh, the demand is so, so, he has so much demand that he has not the, the sufficient offer to sell to people. Now people are even like waiting for a year to have some of this furniture being made for them. So I thought, you know, like when we, when I was um, preparing this presentation, I just like, I thought that it was, amazing to see how the theme that we are now um, speaking about, actually it's already been happening here and even with other artisans, because actually it, you know, we have a, a whole new young generation of artisans in Puerto Rico that are very aware of all the creative industries, uh, scenes and fairs and are very, uh, knowledgeable on how to sell through social media or through different digital platforms. But normally you see that age gap in those type of access and even in the idea of creative industries. So for me to see a very renowned artisan in Puerto Rico that does um, a, a very traditional type of work and being already in that uh, line of, of um, seeing how the traditional craft and folk arts are very popular. Again, it's something that, that you know, it resembles what, what is happening. So, ah, I don't know how to, let me see how. No, I don't know how to, let me see. Perhaps it. 
press the escape, escape button perhaps? Yeah, well, yeah, that's it. You know, like, you know, I, I try to be like very, go just like straight to the point because, you know, I just wanted to un poco más bien, o sea, I was sorry, sorry to talk Spanish, speaking Spanish. I was just trying to like more like to give you an example of what is happening in Puerto Rico. And the thing is that here we like uh, craft and folk arts are very, uh, uh, regularizado. It's, you know, very, um, stop share. It's, um, yeah. I don't know what's the word. Can someone help me? Like regularizado? Does someone know in Spanish in here? Regulado. So re very, regulated. Re regulated. Regulated. Thank you. Oh my God. Thank you. You know, it's a it's a type of work that is very regulated. Actually, it's the only um, aside from the law of uh, for creative industries. It's the only other law about arts in general and cultural heritage. And it's the uh, the oldest law that we have in this type of of of, of thing. So to be an artisan in Puerto Rico, it's something that gives people a lot of pride. And, but at the same time, nor the government or nor the different institutions have given uh, this uh, big uh, sector the importance that it deserves. So for the past five years, we have been working very hard in gathering information about the economic impact of folk arts and craft fairs. And the thing is that at the same time, we are trying to just like manage the conversation in a way that doesn't simplify all cards and crafts just in based on their economic impact or also in their cultural heritage and you know and cultural importance and social importance and historical importance, especially in our case, we are a colony. So culture is a very like political force in Puerto Rico at the same time. Um, so I just wanted like to give you like a, an idea, a general idea of, of how crafts in Puerto Rico are regulated and like what's happening and, and the work that we have been doing toward the process of just like having the recognition, having crafts recognized as a, as a creative industry within the law and within all the governmental entities that work with economic development and with arts and culture. Okay, thank you very much. That uh, it's again, food for thought. Um, again, don't hesitate to uh, drop questions in the chat. But in the meantime, we move to Yuri. Uh, Yuri Januarius, um, who, is, uh, who has a track record in the heritage sector in Flanders, especially with respect to craftsmanship, I think. Uh, among other things, he has worked at the program Treasures of In People, which uh, looked for the opportunities of UNESCO's Living Human Treasures program for Flanders. And since I think February 2015, Yuri is coordinator of ETWI, which is the Flemish expertise cell for technical scientific and industrial heritage operating from the Museum of Industrial Heritage in Ghent. And in his talk, Yuri will discuss, I think the outcomes of several safeguarding projects in Flanders and try to critically reflect on opportunities and threats um, uh, linking these safeguarding actions to, to other fields like education, tourists, tourism and product development and, and things like that. So Yuri, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Bert. Normally you can see my screen yeah. now. Uh, good evening, everybody. I hope that everybody is still fresh after three hours of digital uh, meeting, digital workshop. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction uh, and also for the invitation uh, to be able to speak here tonight. Uh, normally, I always start my presentation with a short introduction on uh, ETWI and what we just do, but we have a very tight schedule. So people who are interested in our work can always find more information on our website or can contact me afterwards uh, after the workshop. 
Uh, during this presentation, um, I will focus on two specific quotes in the text uh, Bert sent us in, in advance uh, during the preparation. And uh, there were two quotes that actually triggered me for this uh, talk that I'm uh, giving now. And I quote, um, in the cultural world, craftspeople are enjoying the increasing attention to intangible heritage, as it has been put on the agenda within UNESCO, among others, other organizations. Unfortunately, however, the increasing attention for craftsmanship in the context of intangible heritage does not prevent the assumption of a contradiction between that heritage on the one hand and the so-called modernity on the other hand. That's also what the introduction of Bert was uh, talking about. And also a second quote or second aspect of the text uh, drew my attention. The relationship with education is also difficult for this reason since in education, theories and cognitive skills are invariably rated higher than manual skills, especially if the latter are also old-fashioned. I will tackle uh, both aspects, uh, not so much from a theoretical point of view, but rather from a practical one, via two projects that I've been coordinated uh, in 2014 up until 2018 on one specific craft, the craft of the blacksmith. Uh, also, for people interested, uh, this picture comes from our children's book that my colleague Elizabeth has made recently, where we all, all are actually combining the traditional crafts like blacksmithing with other industrial uh, techniques. Uh, so craft and industry can certainly go hand in hand, if you ask me. But let's set first uh, the scene. As en vuur vz which translates as fire and iron, used to be a Brussels-based association spe specialized in iron and metal and its uh, specific crafts and techniques. Michel Mouton, which is a trained translator and here at the right-hand side of the picture, is then more than 20 years active in organizing workshops in Belgium and also abroad. He embodies a specific philosophy. The first step is the initiation. It's a short introduction of a couple of hours into the craft. It's like a demonstration, if you like. The second step then is the workshop, spread over several days, teaching the basics and working towards a final product that people can use in their everyday lives. The final stage is the masterclass, where more advanced techniques are taught in a longer period of time. In 2013, inspired by the work of Michel Mouton and his association, a cooperation between several heritage organizations, submitted a dossier for a so-called heritage project of three years, aiming at taking big steps in safeguarding the traditional craft of the artist blacksmith. And that's when I take my first step in this blacksmithing scene in Belgium. You must know that I'm an historian. I like books and uh, uh, dusty archives. So it was a bit of shock uh, to me to get to know this uh, blacksmithing scene in Belgium. Uh, Michelle and I worked on a specific safeguarding program uh, based on safeguarding measures a heritage community can undertake, research, communication, education, etc. I will show you some pictures to give you an idea of the results of the projects and the initiatives that we have been uh, taking in that period. Uh, we organized several activities with and for the heritage communities. Uh, for example, this masterclass with the Italian master blacksmith Claudio Botero in Brussels. We also started uh, a nice cooperation with uh, academies and uh, adult educational programs, for example, in compiling a file for the so-called national uh, qualifications framework. That's a framework where the professional qualifications of crafts can be regulated. Um, this happened for blacksmiths in 2015, and the file was approved in 2016. Finally, we also spent a lot of time documenting uh, the craft and communicating around the craft, doing research on the history of blacksmiths in Flanders and Brussels, and also doing research on the current heritage communities, uh, starting a newsletter, starting with a communication plan, a new website, and also investing a lot in interviews and uh, photographs of craftspeople and also the work of blacksmiths. A spin-off and also the second project I want to talk about started during the second year of the safeguarding project that has been made possible by the King Baudouin Foundation, which coordinates the Sofina Fund. So that's a fund uh, of the family Boel, which is investing in traditional crafts. 
the fund was interested in supporting new crafts based educational programs with a clear link to our built heritage. After a first failed attempt, our second project called Virtuoso met Vu, or loosely translated as Virtuoso on Fire, started in 2016 and ran for three years. Again, the philosophy was simple but effective. During eight weeks in a year, spread over three years, two international renowned uh, blacksmiths came to Belgium and taught uh, students the ins and the outs of the craft. It was not a basic training that you can get in academies or other programs, but an advanced course uh, aiming at developing the, uh, the own style of the young blacksmiths and thus bringing the craft into the 21st century. The program not only focused on the skills, but also on the other sides or sides of a craft, administration, communication, and also developing a small business. After a first selection also made by the two masters, Claudio Botero, and here uh, visible in the middle of the picture, Pavel Tasovsky, 10 motivated young blacksmiths were allowed to the training program. They had one big dream to become professional blacksmiths, combining traditional techniques with contemporary design. Three years later, in November 2018, six blacksmiths graduated during a well-attended ceremony in the smithy of Marcinelle near Charleroi. The young blacksmiths not only invested a large amount of time in their career, they also formed a nice network, a heritage community, if you like, which, up, in, which up until today regularly comes together. It's my hope that one day they will become also masters themselves, uh, starting transmitting their knowledge and thus still stay safeguarding the craft. Let us then return to the main question of my presentation uh, and also uh, one of the questions of this workshop, the paradox between the modernity uh, and a tradition and also the educational issue. What can we learn looking at both projects related to these uh, questions? And I think that two conclusions uh, can be discussed right now. First of all, uh, both projects with a clear focus on intangible cultural heritage really made a difference for these heritage communities and these blacksmiths, the craftspeople involved in uh, blacksmithing. They were challenged to think about their craft from a new, fresh perspective. Why is it still relevant and important today? Um, thinking about traditional techniques and values, as already mentioned by Glenn uh, earlier this evening, but also how this craft can earn a place in the 21st century, looking at that tradition. What about the paradox then between this tradition and this modernity? On the one hand, from a technical point of view, the craft is evolving, introducing new techniques. For example, instead of working with coal, gas ovens and also the more environmentally friendly induction fires are used. Blacksmiths also have been triggered to think outside the box and invent, invest in contemporary design, as is shown by these two pictures. On the other hand, from a more economic perspective, there is a bigger issue at stake. The products made by traditional blacksmiths are expensive and thus placed in a niche. And of course, during a safeguarding program, it was not possible to change the market. Although we have been working on a better understanding why certain products made by hands, by the hands of these craftsmen and women come with a specific price. The craft of the blacksmith is a real job with potential, not only in design, but also in the restoration sector. The paradox between modernity and tradition is for this craft best felt when looking at the economic reality of the job. Secondly, intensively safeguarding a craft can really make a difference for the future of that craft. But critically looking back at both projects, we have been working too isolated, missing the necessary links to get a sustainable future for our blacksmiths. I will illustrate this with two examples. An essential part of safeguarding crafts is, of course, a possibility of learning the craft. In Flanders, we're blessed to have several uh, good educational programs, uh, for example, in art academies or centers of adult education. But when these educational programs are endangered, red flags must go up. And this happened during the first part of our safeguarding program. The Art Academy in Antwerp has, together with the Academy in Brussels, the best program for blacksmiths in our country. 
As the Academy faced a budget cut of 10%, the direction decided to cancel right away the blacksmithing course, rather than make a budget cut in all the educational programs and thus saving the blacksmithing course. So on the one hand, we as a heritage professional are working on a safeguarding program, drawing attention to the importance of the craft, not only from an ICH perspective, but also from other perspectives, like the economic one. And then on the other hand, there is a major player in the sector of uh, the blacksmithing field, an important cornerstone for the future of this craft, decided to cancel the program right away. Within the project and as heritage workers, we couldn't do anything about the situation. Together with the teacher and the students, we organized crowdfunding and sold uh, the unique key rings that you can see here in the picture, uh, collecting 5,000 euros. Um, this was also an action that was supported by a very famous Belgian artist, and I guess that the Belgian colleagues uh, attending this workshop will recognize uh, her. That 5,000 euros was the amount necessary to organize uh, an alternative for the course uh, at the academy for just one year. But that was merely a symbolic action. After that year, no funding was found, and the once important educational program with a lot of tradition and history was stopped. This frustrated the blacksmiths, uh, creating a field of tension with our own safeguarding program. In other words, why should we safeguard a craft in the heritage sector, in the heritage field, uh, where, where in other domains, the value of the craft is not recognized? The second example brings us another case, documenting a craft. During the program, Virtuoso on Fire, we try to experiment with several documentation tools for blacksmiths. The fact that two international masters came to Belgium to teach was, of course, exceptional. The natural reflex of a heritage professional is, let's document the whole process. It can give valuable insights for other blacksmiths who couldn't attend, of course, the workshops. But also the young blacksmiths were at first eager to experiment with several participatory documenting techniques. This documentation could be very valuable for their own future activities. We discussed several possibilities of documenting. At first, I was in charge of documenting the whole process. But very soon it became clear that due to the fact that I was not a professional blacksmith and that I, that I only had followed uh, small courses, I missed essential parts. I could not capture the specific embodied knowledge from the masters. The young blacksmiths tried on their turn to document the process. The initial enthusiasm decreased as it became clear that it was not only time consuming, but it also distracted the students from the course. And the question was raised, why are we documenting? Let us just do our job and learn the craft. Of course, documenting was a process that was part of the project and was also something that the SOFINA funds required from uh, the organization and from uh, the students. So finally, we came with a creative solution uh, that had an added value for all the parties concerned. A portfolio, as you can see in the image here, was an interesting tool. It contained drawings, plans, and technical information of each piece that was created during the whole process, complemented with one or several pictures of the final piece. So no fancy photo shoots, films, or diaries. This portfolio worked out very well. It was a very specific outcome that served a clear purpose with a clear added value in the first place for the heritage community itself. To come to a conclusion, I think it's not uh, easy with the small time frame we have this evening uh, based on several projects within one craft to make some general conclusions, but I believe also based on other experiences and on other crafts that future academic research and also heritage research on the paradox between modernity and uh, tradition should leave enough room for individual and also in-depth case studies. Because I believe that um, every craft and every heritage community has a specific, specific ecosystem that should be researched. Furthermore, uh, future heritage projects should also uh, try to make more crossovers and uh, with other societal domains, like for example, education, product development, and tourism. Uh, necessary in incentives should be provided uh, by the relevant policy makers to make these crossovers possible. I thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Yuri. Uh, I think it was a nice illustration of the, the problems we actually started from when we conceived, but then much more substantiated. The problems which we actually started from when, when conceiving this, uh, this workshop, yeah. Thank you very much. I didn't see anything in the chat, but there's room for questions now. And there's a possibility to raise hands as well, I, I suppose. I can't see where it is myself. But... Oh yeah. So if you want to raise hands, it's on reactions, I think, below on the... I have a question, Bert. Yeah. Yes, for... Um, um... Jessa, um, how much of uh, the uh, Taino culture do you think it's still preserved today within Puerto Rico? Well, um, in the especially in the case of traps and, and folk arts, it's very, um, we have a lot of traps and folk arts that are, that resembles Taino art and and actually it has a lot of presence. It's, it's interesting because for example, um, in the past, I don't know, like 10 years, our census have changed a lot. 10 years ago, people in Puerto Rico uh, said in the, in the census, in the population census that we were white. And you know, it, it had a lot of studies. Like people were like, come on, I don't know, like look at us. So, for example, in, the, in Puerto Rican, in the in the in, in Puerto Rico, I am considered a white woman, you know, but I am not a white woman in the Western sense. So it was when 10 years ago, the the most part of the population, when when most part of the population said, you know, just like that they saw themselves as, as white, just having totally um erasing all the Taino and the African heritage. A lot of uh, a lot of educational work started, you know, like being done by the academia, by different uh, gen uh, geneticists, uh, geneticista, you know, like people that study ATN and, and all that. And actually, a lot of ATN DNA DNA um, research what what discovered is that more than 80% of our population has Taino DNA on, on our, you know, on our blood, on our system. So I think that in a way that started to make it like have some kind of, of resemblance in the way that we saw each other, but especially when we go to the cultural scenario, Taino culture is very, it's, it's very hard, you know, it's, it's very, upfront, especially in crafts and folk arts. And actually yesterday, we in the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, we just published an amazing uh, catalog. It's just like a, of Taino art in Puerto Rico. And it has amazing in both in English and Spanish. So let me see if I can, I'm going to just like see, um, send in the chat a uh, catalog. I'm going to send in the chat the, the information. Um, in order for you all to see, but we just uh, published yesterday this amazing catalog um, with essays from different uh, archaeologists and anthropologists uh, talking about the Taino culture in Puerto Rico and especially the different theories. But because even nowadays, um, there are contradicting theories about the some developments or so the of, of different aspects of the Taino culture in general of the times of the cultures that we all call Taino, but actually are divided into different uh, indigenous cultures that came from different parts of the Americas to, to Puerto Rico and the Caribe. So I think that it's, uh, we have had in the past 10, 15 years, a new awakening to, to really give the Taino cultural heritage and, uh, the, and the Taino DNA heritage that we have, the space that it deserves. 
And one of the things that especially in folk arts, it's very, it has a very strong presence as well as the African heritage. And in a way, folk arts in Puerto Rico are identified by the Taino symbols. You know, when, when you go around in any type of shop or museum or festival, for example, just to name a, new, a few spaces where you can see art, folk arts in special, you know, have a, a, a lot of, they try to resemble a lot of that Taino artistic uh, culture. So I think that, yeah, I think that in the past few years, it has been uh, uh, a new, uh, uh, some new games have been won in that aspect of not being just like whiting ourselves out and just like having a more uh, laugh and, and, and actually educating ourselves about our heritage. And one thing that is very interesting is that actually for so much, for many, many years, we learned in school that Taino culture was very undeveloped in comparison with other indigenous cultures around the Americas. And in the last few years, uh, some new uh, research have come out and new discoveries that actually put the Taino culture in a very developed uh, scenario. So that's something that has been, and it has been very discussed in the public media, which is normally not something that happened, it didn't happen before. So I think that we are in the right path to, uh, to, to gain like uh, with the, I think in Spanish, and uh, you know, like so. I'm just like translating, and so the thing I think that we're in the right path to be to have the uh, el orgullo, you know, to to be the pride. Yeah. yeah, to have the the pride on on the different the mixes that 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 create us, but also in a way that doesn't. Uh, erase the importance, you know, the, the, the racism that we still have, you know, because that's the thing with, in Caribbean cultures, we like to talk about these, like we are a mixed race and that sometimes just like uh, has a, a lot of racism like underneath and that we don't really uh, take it, take it like upfront or discuss it in a, in a, in an upfront way and that it's, it's starting to just like, I don't know, just like to come off, you know, like every time like people are being more aware and and having more pride, I think. Thank you, so, Jessica. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going I to send a, you the, the information about the catalog. The sure. catalog. Thank you. I have uh, yeah. two questions in the chat from Sharif Jamalin. Sharifa, can you? Perhaps unmute yourself. Yeah, or... sure, sure. I wasn't sure if I was going to be talking or is, I'm quite tired. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, uh, I have two questions. I think it's linked uh, for Jessa and for Yuri. Basically, uh, what challenges do you face in having crafts recognized uh, as a creative industry, which I think is a great, great idea. It's kind of a gap. Um, I think you're right that uh, crafts are uh, undervalued and, and in fact they should be overvalued because it's amazing skill and amazing, I mean, perhaps, uh, yeah. And then Yori, uh, how crafts, uh, I'm not sure because um, I thought crafts in uh, Belgium and in Holland was a lot more protected than other parts of the world. Uh, there is some sort of recognition of like Erfgoed, um, uh, so I was surprised that uh, that uh, what you were talking about with the blacksmiths not uh, yeah being underfunded or not or whatever you were mentioning there yeah like for example the flax industry is very well protected it's a very powerful craft uh, or I guess it's industrialized but it is an old tradition of flax uh, linen and fabric so those are uh, kind of related but I'm not sure if it's quite related but. That's my question. So the challenges you face and yep. the recognition of the of the indus, of craft in your regions. Jess or Yuri, who wants to come first? 
Yeah, maybe I can I can start yeah. and, and you can yeah. uh, weigh in uh, if you like. Well, the situation in, in Belgium is is quite uh, complex with, because we have a um, Belgium is a very complicated uh, country with a lot of administrations and a lot of governments. So on the on the federal level uh, for Belgium uh, as a whole, uh, there is uh, on the the agency of uh, the federal agency of uh, uh, economic affairs. Uh, has indeed a, a formal label uh, that you can uh, apply as crafts uh, man or crafts uh, woman, uh, so you can get a recognition as a, a crafts person. Uh, but that's only an official recognition from uh, the government in order to be able to participate in the in the uh, the crafts days uh, that it, that are organized in uh, in November each year. Um, so um, if the craft is endangered, that recognition will not help uh, safeguarding that specific uh, craft. It's more an official recognition in order to be able to organize the, uh, the uh, craft days in, uh, in November. And then from the heritage perspective, uh, on a Flemish level, there is, of course, like the UNESCO list, representative list for intangible heritage. There are also national lists. Uh, so several crafts are already inscribed in this list, and that gives, of course, a certain dynamic for these heritage communities to safeguard and to continue safeguarding for future generations. But they're, they're, that's actually the same as with the economic recognition. Uh, that isn't a certainty that when the craft is endangered, that the future of the craft uh, is secured. So it's merely a recognition, a symbolic recognition. Uh, but certainly not uh, a recognition in, in, or um, a protection, uh, like, for example, the built heritage in uh, Belgium or in other countries uh, is uh, protected. There is no legal basis uh, that comes with uh, the recognition on a federal level or from the uh, Flemish on the Flemish level. And what uh, on the flex uh, fabric production, it's recognized, I'm not sure. It's, uh, of course, an, an industrial tradition. But uh, the, uh, the more craft-related tradition uh, is not recognized uh, for as far as I know. Uh, but of course, it's still very present, uh, certainly in the West Flanders, um, where a lot of flex uh, fabrics and mills were located. Yes, so do you want to add something? Yeah. Well, to be I, I Brief, perhaps? Super. Okay, so I think that with, in our case, as I, as I said in my presentation, craft and work arts here in Puerto Rico are very regulated and also are very socially consumed. So they have a, an, an important uh, part, you know, they play an important part in our cultural scenario. The thing for us was more like artisans as well as other artists didn't have the um, the like the sales outlets or the or the knowledge sometimes to be more uh, assertive in the way that they sold their products or to be able to sell in new platforms. And for example, in our case with the pandemia, with the pandemic, uh, it was uh, a before and after because here in Puerto Rico, direct sales, like in person direct sales, and I think that that happens in many other places but it's like the biggest uh, sales outlet for artisans. So when everything here in Puerto Rico, the pandemic has been taken with a lot of, so it has been, so we are, you know, so we, it has been taken very seriously. The population in general has taken it very seriously. So we had a very early lockdown and very strict lockdown. And what happened is that many artisans didn't have the, the means to sell their art. So that, you know, that exacerbated during the pandemic, but it's something that was already happening. And that is why in the past years, we have working so hard in just having all these workshops in entrepreneurship and just like in a way of business development, but cultural business development and not so much in the, in the, in the crafts or, or folk arts uh, 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 knowledge, for example, as in the case of, of Jerry. So um, the thing is that because creative industries are are being now like uh, are, are being now promoted um, with different incentives uh, by the government, and actually crafts are like in the center of the creative industries. That's why we want uh, 
being so we, we are working toward having crafts and folk arts recognized as creative industries because not only it makes sense like in the you know yeah. in the definition of what they are but also because the government is taking a step forward in really promoting creative industries as a means to to have a, a more like a social responsible economic development uh, and that is why for us it's so important. And also because uh, ICP never really, even though o sea, ICP has done an amazing job for the past 65 years, especially under Dr. Ricardo Alegría, but the economic aspect of culture was never a main uh, theme in the different, in the agenda. And actually, even actually when the, when the Creative Industries Act was uh, promulgated in Puerto Rico, the, the the executive executive director of the ICP at that time even said that folk arts shouldn't be included in that definition because culture was not because culture was not like marketing and you know I, and I think that things have changed a lot and you have them have a cultural marketing that uh, that is este, that respects the cultural heritage of the product and of the way that it is produced, but also for the, the creators to have um, a just economic development by selling their, act, their pieces, their art. So that's why we have been working in that different area. Okay, thank you. We are running behind schedule a bit, but if I'm informed correctly, Joko van der Abele has a question. So if it can be brief, Joko, then uh, yes, you can maybe have a final we can, question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Maybe we can discuss it later also, Yuri, because if I understood you well, you depicted two very different ways of education, eh? trying to organize it uh, with the craftsmen and eh, with, with different steps, eh, ending with the masterclass. But you also have experience with the adult education institution. And it was a very, as I understood, a very nasty or bad experience because they, they, they decided to cancel it. And did I understand it well because it was not of an economic value anymore? It couldn't, why was it canceled? Well, they had to make, there was a budget cut from 10%. Um, yes, but, uh, at, but then, at the, then they ha they looked at, at at the courses that were less. What 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 was the problem with these courses? Well, th there wasn't so much a problem. Um, well, there there was one problem with the infrastructure. Um, the course in Antwerp at the academy is organized at the uh, Antwerp Zuiderpechthuis, um, which is surrounded by very expensive lofts where people are living. It mm -hmm. used to be an industrial site where people were indeed blacksmithing or uh, uh, practicing the craft of a blacksmith. But of course, they're, uh, craft, they're working with coal and you have this, um, this pollution coming from the, the workshop entering into the lofts of the wealthy people uh, who bought very expensive lofts uh, on the place where always there was always industrial activity. So there, there have been some complaints uh, over the years by some um, people who were very unhappy living in those lofts, very unhappy with, of course, with the pollution of the of the workshop. But that is something that can be um, mm, arranged, solved, yeah, yeah, yeah. arranged. Yes, so you can you can uh, place another more expensive um, system in order to get uh, mm. a, a better suction of the fumes of the of the coal fire. Uh, but it was very unclear. The, the teacher uh, thought it was some kind of uh, an afrikening with him uh, because mm -hmm. they had a lot of um, conflicts during the years. So he, he thought it was more like a personal issue that he had with uh, the director of the uh, of the academy. Mm -hmm. um, so that these two things uh, might, but because the, 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 there was not really a problem with uh, the, the amount of students in the mm -hmm. in the, the course. There were plenty of students. Uh, also coming from the Netherlands, for example, uh, traveling uh, two or three times per week to come to the uh, to the smithy in Antwerp. So that that wasn't really the issue. Um, mm. no. So you will try to 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 to, to arrange uh, to organize these courses again within this con setting of adult education, or 
Well, there is still a, a very good academy in Brussels. Uh, mm. We invested uh, three millions in a state-of-the-art uh, workshop for blacksmiths. Um, and people who are interested now in Antwerp, uh, but also in the Netherlands, uh, come to Brussels for the, mm. uh, for the workshops. So they really decided not to uh, invest in the Antwerp Academy anymore. And uh, people who are interested have to go to Brussels for uh, their education yeah. there. Yeah. Thank okay, you. thanks. Um, we still have two uh, presentations to go. Um, and the first is from Hal Butfin. And Hal is the director of special projects at the Smithsonian Center for Folkland and Cultural Heritage in Washington. And she will concentrate on the question of whether and how artisans can effectively strengthen their local ecosystems and, and their cultural vitality through interventions to uh, sustain craft practices. And I think with a special focus on how artisans connect with designers in collaborative relationships. Hal, you have the floor. Thank you. I've really enjoyed um, listening. I'm, I'm in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina right now on a project um, working on doing some trainings actually for festival organizers that are engaged in cultural heritage. And so I'm quite exhausted. <laughs> I taught all day today and it's quite late for me. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, please just bear with me for a moment. Um, it should be working. Well, but is it the beginning of the presentation or the end? It's there we go. It's not in presentation mode yet. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Morning. All right. So a little bit of background for those who may not be familiar. I work at the the broader Smithsonian institution most folks are aware of. Um, it's uh, we have 19 museums and nine research, nine research centers focused on science as well as culture. And we're based in Washington, DC, but we do a lot of work all over the world. And the center where I work is one of our cultural centers. It's the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. And so in contrast to our museums, our center is really focused on people. And each year we put on an annual festival that takes place on the National Ball in Washington, DC, except for the last two years, of course, we've been online, uh, but we're gonna be back on the mall this year. Uh, but the festival has been taking place since 1967 and it's a celebration of folk and traditional arts. It was born out of the civil rights movement in that era in an effort to give a platform, recognizing that uh, folk and traditional artists part of the um, effort to sustain their practices really was about giving them a platform and prestige uh, and that association with the Smithsonian and the iconic, the symbolism of being on the National Mall um, where they're performing with the Washington Monument and the National Capitol. And it began as a celebration of American folk life and over many years, um, we have also presented culture from around the world. So I joined the center in 2016 a background in international development. And for a number of years, I ran a fair trade business out of East Africa and worked on advising artists and enterprises on a lot of the things Jessa was talking about, the equitable kind of um, social, social impact entrepreneurship and economic opportunity for artisans. And then running my own business, although I'm not a maker myself, um, I grew up in a maker family and I kind of, you know, I understood what was required from the business perspective of it. So I definitely teach from practice, um, but I also know from running my own business how difficult it can be and how much the global market can really look like an answer to all of our solutions, both for economic viability for craft and, and also just for um, revenue. And it, it looks like a golden ticket. So what I wanna talk to you all about today in this context is some reflections uh, about making and, cult and cultural sustainability. The program that I run is very much focused around helping different communities around the world sustain their cultural practices and looking at different efforts that folks are doing and learning from each other and trying to figure out what the solution is. And when it comes to craft, we really are um, very much shifting perspectives, me personally, and just kind of 
looking at the way the approach is going and and what I've been discussing with a lot of folks that work in this space is um is a real change in our approach to the way that we intervene in these in craft communities around the world. So first of all, as we've been talking about quite a bit here, artisans are both producers and stewards of material culture. Um, the photos that are in this slideshow are from our various projects. This is Armine Pogosian, who's a lace maker in Armenia. And Armine carries forward this tradition that has been passed on generation to generation. And you can see her students here. Um, she's actually, you know, from, it was traditionally passed on through families and Armine teaches at a school and teaches lace making to students in that school and carrying it forward. And she was participated in our program, which helped her set up a business around lace making. She was already a teacher and setting up a, an enterprise around it to earn a living. So some of the things we've been talking about, some of the dynamics that we've seen over the years, and this is really, you know, looking at this case of homogenization and the globalization and urbanization has resulted in many cases and many communities isolating artisans, although that's rapidly changing because of availability of internet and transportation and, and movement, like we've been talking about. Um, this background image is from a bootmaker that we work with um, ethnic Tibetans in China that are trying to sustain their practices there. So some statistics came out several years ago from the Aspen Institute that really saw that in the developing world, craft is the second largest employer. The opportunities for economic growth are immense. And this is especially true if you broaden the definition to creative industries. And I was really interested in, in Jess's description of this because I've, from working globally, I've noticed that cultural <laughs> industries is a term that people are using more and more. And that's, being, and that's describing not just craft, but also film and photography and graphic design and illustration. And so we're seeing that space is so expansive, but trying to figure out where, where does craft fit into it? And I thought it was particularly interesting, just as a little side note, that in a, we just did a user experience research project for our center's website. And our audiences, which included our own staff and folks that work in the sector, no one knew what creative industries meant. Um, they weren't familiar with the term. So it felt very jargony and was difficult to communicate to our audience. One of the challenges I'm having as we are doing this work of communicating to folks about what it is that we're doing. So I thought that was really, I felt happy to be in company with someone who understands that term because it can be kind of challenging to communicate what it is that we're trying to do. So on this topic, you see craft can be, it's a large employer, it's a really big opportunity for people to have a livelihood, especially in many cases when um, communities are engaged in agriculture or other practices, and then craft is also bringing in income on the side. But what we're also seeing in different communities around the world is that local customers are, are turning to cheaper foreign alternatives. This is stuff that we've all discussed. Um, this is a black potter also in a Tibetan community in China that we worked with. So enter the development project. There's lots of money being driven to, um, to really kind of support and, and look at this proposition that craft can really be an engine for economic growth with a market-driven approach. But the question there is which market? And what I've seen time and time again is that the focus is often on the global market. And the artisans that we work with around the world very much want to see their product out in the world. That, that aspect that I was talking about with the Folk Life Festival where we're putting craft on a platform where it receives recognition by other people, uh, that builds pride, that's really important. That helps people to see, you know, helping people to see cultural heritage through someone else's eyes really, I mean, with the festival, that's what we really see is, is really beneficial. But the answer isn't necessarily selling the product in the global market. Um, when we do that, and, and I, this is where I speak from experience with my own business, um, there's a desire for handmade technique. And often in the global market, people are expecting an affordable price because you're making a craft product that's competing against mass-produced products that look similarly. And especially 
as craft as is recognized in a mainstream way and you go to big box stores and things like that that are selling what appear to be craft products. Some of them are, some of them are not. Some of them are mass produced and they look like craft products. And so you're entering this global market that has trends, seasons, it moves quick. And by and large, the people that are buying the products have absolutely no idea about the context of the craft. So the intervention is to then work with the community if we're trying to attract, you know, go to the global market, change the color, look at a motif or a technique and create a globalized product, something that's going to attract an international audience. So often this results in short-term short design innovation. And it can be exciting. It can feel innovative when there's exchange between makers or designers in the West and in other parts of the world. Um, but what ends up happening in many cases is that those designers are operating and innovating based on their own cultural context and aesthetic. And the question that I kept coming back to in our work is, what does the craft then mean for communities when it's severed from its cultural context? I was having a conversation with a very well-meaning woman who was helping a community, an indigenous community, in the Amazon that was losing a, a weaving technique. And her answer was that she had a contact at Ikea and they were gonna start weaving cabinetry covers for um, kitchen cabinets at Ikea. And the question is, okay, well that's, you could then employ a lot of people in this community, um, but then are you not reducing it to this capitalist consumer society and removing the product from the community where it matters? And so it's extremely complicated. And what we wanted to see if we could do and what we've been focusing on for the last several years at the center is centering the concept that artisans are both producers and stewards of material culture. So our shift instead has been to look at how to cultivate local ecosystems. So being in the communities where we're working, there are people who are designing within those communities. There are people working in the cultural, cultural and creative industries in those communities, as well as artisans. What kind of resources can we drive to that space to allow for creation and innovation within that community for the craft within its cultural context? In this space, we did this on an extended project in Armenia that the impact has been pretty profound. Um, by working with local Armenian designers and makers and linking them together, they understood each other. They both have a shared understanding of cultural and historical context and significance of the craft practice. So any kind of shifts in the product are grounded in that understanding and in the traditional craft practice it itself. And then, so what we're trying to get to is a space where artisans have the skills and tools that they need to innovate for making products within their own community. And the reality of this is that the economic benefit is still there. And that's the thing that was very surprising when we first started working on it, for example, in Armenia, is that we found people like Armine who were very dedicated to a craft practice were mostly earning a living from teaching and weren't really sure how to sell the products on the side, like Tessa was talking about. They really needed the business aspect of it. And so we looked at what could we do to help artisans who were already making and already committed and teaching to actually create viable businesses so that they could then supplement their income and make their craft practice a full part of what they do every day. And so, our suggestions and kind of path forward and paradigm for doing this work is to try and take a holistic look at the craft practice. We connected and engaged local researchers to help us in the first place to identify the right communities to work with. Um, we looked at who's championing cultural heritage in this space and really analyzed the local market potential and what's there. We also surveyed local attitudes. One of our projects in Bhutan is we're funding, um, we're working with the Royal Textile Academy there. They're worried about the sustainability of the handloom textiles. And so we're funding a research study on youth attitudes towards those handloom textiles so they can really understand demand and the attitudes towards purchasing those products. 
So what we're looking at is trying to really understand what design means and how it's different when it's done in the context of a community where the cultural heritage is, has meaning and significance and finding out who's practicing design in that community. So we try to view craft as an ecosystem, because it is, um, fostering connections where we can across local creative and cultural industries, connecting among, between generations, and recognizing that the value of an, outsi an outsider's gaze can matter, but it does not need to translate into a focus on the outsider's market. So what that looks like practically um, for the work that we've done in Armenia, where it's been the most intensive, is working with artisans, documenting what they're doing through a combination of working with local photographers and videographers. We made really beautiful photography that was the storyboarding and all of that was done with the artisan engaged with the photographer and with the filmmaker to make short films about their work. Um, we gave them some support on not a lot of product development, but really about making a collection and how to present your work as a collection, branding. Um, we supported them to work with and engage with graphic designers to understand how to make a logo and an identity and to tell their story and their own first person narrative of their story and how to share that with audiences. And really what that came out to is um, ultimately businesses. Um, we, we then had created, a, there was no craft market. And so we, we helped establish a craft market where then artisans could come together and sell their products, but also demonstrate them and have visitors understand the craft and see how the craft takes place. Um, and at that festival, by bringing in that context, we also had workshops where we would allow for the artisans then to teach adults and children alike, uh, like an easier version of the craft so that they could learn. And really through this, at the end of the day, the Armenia project, um, we worked with about, we started out with about 100 artisans, um, kind of filters down of who really stays in the program and works on it over a few years. And at the end of it, in the beginning, only three were registered businesses. By the end, 50 had actually registered formal businesses with the government, and that has become their primary income. And additionally, and this is another topic, but 29 of them actually opened up their workshops to tourists, um, which opened up additional um, uh, streams of revenue, which is very important to have diversified revenue for craft. So a combination of teaching, um, showing tourists the workshops, and then also selling at retail events. And again, these retail events are primarily local audiences. It's at local festivals. Um, so that's kind of been the approach that we've taken that we've seen has really generated a lot more success. And through the pandemic also has built a lot of resilience. So when I say your greatest value, it's in the perspective of people that are working in communities with craft in this way of how important it is if for, for makers that are going through doing kind of these op opportunities for designer exchange and collaborations is about sharing your own experience as a maker or a small business owner and appreciating the craft in context and exchanging skills and technique rather than something extractive, which often happens where the designer is going to a place the local artisan that they meet with is producing something and they're coming back and selling it in their market. So that is, in a nutshell, um, our work. I know that we're running short on time and have another presentation. So I am going to stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, indeed, it, it was again uh, very valuable, I think, in our in our search for tools and instruments to support craftspeople and to, to find new ways of evaluation and assessment and things like that in a supportive way. So thanks, and let's move now to the last speaker, which is uh, Antoine Gauthier. And Antoine is the director of the Conseil Québécois du Patrimoine Vivant. And that's uh, in Quebec, an umbrella organization of over 100 
intangible cultural heritage organizations. And Antoine, I think, will address the theme of the of the day to a reflection on the socioeconomic studies of the Quebec Living Heritage Council, uh, published in a collection, Cultural Traditions of Quebec in Figures. Antoine? Thank you, Bert. Hello, everybody. Hello. Since I'm the, you hear me, yeah? All right, since I'm the last guy, I'm, I'm gonna try to be very succinct. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Can you see it? Is it working? Yes, all right. Well, as Bert said, I'm the executive director of the Quebec Council on Intangible Heritage here in Canada, where it's starting to snow right now for the first time of the year. It's the long, a long season is coming. Uh, so we are, yeah, basically a number of organizations since now 25 years. In, we're not working only with crafts. We're, we're working with a lot of traditions, including artistic traditions and uh, traditional medicine and stuff like that. But crafts is a, a very important part of the work uh, we're doing. We're part, I must say we are partner of the Quebec Council of Crafts, which is another organization uh, funded not by the Ministry of Culture, as we are, but with uh, the, uh, some department for, uh, for business related to crafts. And is, this organization is more dedicated with the law on, uh, on, art, on the artists, on the statute of the artists. And so they represent basically individual, professional individuals in the craft system as uh, we are representing more uh, associations in the culture system, not necessarily professional. And uh, we are a partner too, I don't know if you're familiar with the Econo Museum um, sector, which is uh, uh, heritage who earn his life. It's a system of like kind of museum, but more like a place where you can see the artisan, the craft, craft a person working you can buy you can learn so it's kind of a mix between a business and a museum it's a very interesting network uh, all uh, internationally uh, recognized and uh, you can find economy museums in several countries and the head the head is uh, based in quebec city actually the, the president the director of this organization is the chairman of uh, the cqpv um, so we are funded part by the Quebec Ministry of Culture, we must say, and thank, thank you to them. This is just a glimpse of, you know, geographically, who we are representing, who we are working for, who, who are on our board. So we represent basically the association of craft people or artists uh, who need stuff politically or react to bills or um, make some studies or organize festivals, stuff like that. That's what we are doing. Some projects we are, we are currently doing. We have a network of 35 festivals linked to the tradition culture here in, in the Quebec province. This is what I want to talk to you about is uh, we started a few several years ago trying to make some statistics on crafts or you know we we did the last one is uh, on the building of uh, wooden boats before that it was the instrument makers uh, before that blacksmithing milling traditional arts culture traditional dance and so on why we've been doing that well is to understand intangible cultural heritage and mostly it's different elements because we are always talking about intangible heritage, intangible heritage, and nobody really knows exactly what it means in terms of who is doing what and, and who's supported by who. Um, a lot of ministries thinks or that other ministries are doing stuff for intangible heritage elements and sometimes it's not really true and nobody have the same information so if we want to manage 
the development or the safeguarding of all those sectors, we, we together with all the, our members felt that we needed uh, to better administrate the sector. We needed some figures, some uh, statistics, some quantitative data, as well as qualitative data, because we make some surveys, but also we regroup people in, in groups and ask them questions, what are the needs, what are the problems of the sector, how can we solve those problems. So basically we made at the end some recommendation to uh, sometimes to, the, to the, the, the tradition bearers themselves, sometimes to the government. And uh, the goal is to have information and to, to safeguard tradition, the ICH, Intangible Cultural Heritage. Um, so we have a lot of statistics in a lot of themes in, in the cultural sector here in Quebec, thanks to the Cultural Observatory of Quebec, which is part of an uh, institute of statistics, I have a lot of statistics, but nothing really for ICH because it's too small. And uh, it's, um, well, from, for some legal question too, it's hard to do statistics by the government itself. Uh, so we decided to do it ourselves. Um, the public institution data are rarely oriented toward ICH. It's pretty hard to see what is ICH in all those general data. The UNESCO Cultural Statistics Framework is very vague on how and if we should make some, some concrete data on ICH. Now the overall result framework uh, within the UNESCO uh, convention is pointing very recently towards trying to measure or assess exactly what we are talking about. So it's, I welcome it, uh, although it's not a perfect tool, I must say, but I, it's very welcomed and it's geared toward the results and not only uh, discourses and good photos. So it's very welcome. Uh, this is a kind, of, there's a lot of data. Uh, we can find like this is the, those are the links between the websites. It's kind of a mirror of uh, what we you can see in the in the real life. Um, this is how this is actually what is the the how the government is sustaining the associations in the cultural sector. So we can see the government is safeguarding mostly other stuff than ICH. So those kind of things permits us to say that to the government afterwards, well, I think if you're saying it's ICH is very important, it should reflect on those kind of charts, which, which was not the case in by the time we did this first uh, figure. The first one we did with was traditional music. I know it's not a craft, but anyway, it's just to say to 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 show you that we try to, to, to look at a lot of places. Is it, is it uh, uh, performant in some way? Can we find traditional music in this envelope? Can we find it in this envelope, in those big festivals, in the conservatories, in the musical camps? So sometimes it's very well reflected. Sometimes it's absent for good reason. And sometimes it's absent for not good reason. So we knock, knock, knock. I think we have to be partners and develop uh, this sector with you. So there's a lot of stakeholders and there's a lot of people to, to partner with. And this is the job we're doing, you know. Uh, what are, for instance, the, the principal, the principal um, uh, needs or challenges to, to uh, develop the sector of the constructing of a wooden boat, for instance? This is just one among a lot of figures, but just to show you what we're, what we're doing, we did the same thing with the millers, you know, how, how did you learn? What's the best way to teach? Uh, how, because it's uh, the main problem is we, nobody wants to be miller anymore and uh, we have to find some new millers. So we have to find new creative ways to, to uh, incentive people or people or more than one to be millers. Um, so that, that's what we are doing to, to build. 
sorry, to build new training uh, for the millers here in Quebec. There's only 10 millers left um, in, tra in traditional mills. Uh, so what we've achieved with all that work, which seems for some uh, too statistical and too theoretic, theoretical, but the, the goal is really to change situation. So to, to safeguard ICH, in other words, uh, we did a guideline for municipalities because a lot of municipal, a lot of cities have said we want to safeguard RCH in their policies, but it wasn't really the case when we looked and we evaluated. So we did with the government a guideline for them, which is helping, uh, still helping a lot. Uh, new funding for traditional music teaching, a new network for traditional dance activities that was not. Uh, in the radar of the government before, uh, implementing training for millers and so on and so on, and wooden boat makers, instrument makers, new new uh, this, uh, new training uh, occasion for them, uh, and we started the uh, living human treasure system, which is not only for professionals; it's for everybody to learn with some. Uh, tradition bearers, important tradition bearers here in Quebec, including uh, uh, indigenous ones, and uh, while well, creating obviously synergy among practitioners, because most of the time, mostly with crafts, actually, they don't really know each other from all the region, and uh, they don't, they never really talk to each other. So it's all, all those are occasion to uh, federate them in one place and and think together, which is which is quite good. All right, that was a really short glimpse of what we were doing, but this is it. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine. Given the given the time and the day we had already, I think it's not too bad to have had a, have a short um, short presentation. It was very good and very valuable as well. So uh, we still have some time. I think about 15 minutes for questions and discussion. I'm actually not sure whether, ah, I see a hand now. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I'm not sure whether the hands work at all, but they seem to be working, but I don't see whose hand it is. It's um, mine, Bert. Um, ah, okay. Yuri. Yeah. Go ahead, Yuri. Thanks. Um, I will also lower my hands in order to prevent some. Yeah. Okay, I, I have a question for Antoine. Um, um, maybe I've missed it, but could you say something about the methodology of the, the several research uh, volumes that we've seen? Are you always using the same methodology for each uh, craft or uh, are you sometimes, uh, is it sometimes necessary to adjust the methodology um, depending on the type of craft you want to investigate? Um, for example, uh, I've also done some research on blacksmiths, but also other, um, other crafts. And it's not always easy to find them and to persuade them to fill in a survey, for example. So I can imagine that maybe you can, you should adjust also the methodology. Uh, could you say something about the way you've handled that for the several crafts that we've seen so far? Well, we are not very rigid on methodologies, and we are we clearly adapt to in whatever element we have because they're really different element and different people, different places, different uh, public institution. But uh, we mainly conduct a, a survey, which is not always the same survey. We work with, uh, with craftsmen, craftswomen and specialists to, to work the question. They are not, this is not a, a, a grocery list we apply each time, no. It's, uh, we want to have specific things about these specific elements. And then we try to, convince the people to participate to the survey with all our partners, our members, and it's it's going pretty well normally because they know us and they see, they know that if they help us, they help them somehow. So, and, uh, and then we make some group, uh, we can pay for for all the you know the expenses the, the traveling and the hotel for everybody so maybe this helps and that but the, the goal is really to try to see uh, the main goal the main focus of our, of our last work is really to see what are the needs for transmission 
and what's exact what is the system of transmission normally there's not re there's no really a system of transmission it's not in the school it's not but it's very informal and sometimes it they it people want to stay it that way very informal but sometimes they want it to be more formal more institutional so we have to make the portrait of all this and and you know the methodology depends on this I would say almost political feature. I say. Thanks. So I'm looking at uh, the chat. I have a question for um, Hal. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right. I think Hal is uh, is, uh, is no longer here. Okay, uh, I'll save to, it. She had to. She had to leave early. I'll save it for later. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, other questions? I'm just gonna put the link in for our publication. It's all free on PDF mm -hmm. in French, of course. But uh, it's okay. it's all for you. Uh, I know. I know a lot of you speak French, so good reading. Well. Uh, Joke. Yes. Um, yes. Helen is not here, but, but maybe someone else can, can also answer. Because I was, yes, it, I, uh, her, yes she, she called it an ecology eh, of, of cultivating local ecosystems for craft. And what I found interesting that she tries to think in another way about economy. So maybe the people who are still present and are, are, are trying to be part of an economy, do they have any sense that, uh, the, uh, the kind of economy that is important for crafts and that is yes, how to say it, nurture the crafts and not only as a, as a selling pro project. So maybe people who have experience with this. So I sense that, that this ecology is very dependent on a very particular kind of economy. And I think it's important that, the, that we can pinpoint that, mm -hmm. the kind of economies that are yes, important, nurturing this craft. And I think it's also in combination with the transmission of, 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 of this knowledge that you could say it's somehow hybrid forms of, of, of education and economy. So, Maybe someone who recognized mm -hmm. this can say something about this. Yeah. Who wants to respond to that? I could uh, try to uh, respond it um, because I think maybe the uh, question is geared towards more tradition and uh, what I think about my work, I think about it more of a social enterprise. Um, in, in my community, to give an example, there's about six six to 7,000 uh, population. And I can safely say about 80% of them are involved in one way or other on the weaving um, tradition, either making or selling the textile. So really our economic, our local e e economy is driven by uh, the sale of our textiles. And not to mention, not to mention the state of Oaxaca uh, overall um, that it is one of the richest uh, state in Mexico when it comes to um, craft. And uh, in, in fact, Oaxaca's economic, it is um, at least 90%, it's thanks to the uh, tourism and the sale of our text and, and the sales of our crafts. So um, really when, when I think about these, uh, these subjects, it is um, definitely it's tied into the well-being of the community, the preservation of the tradition. And uh, just to give an example, my textiles are obviously all dyed with natural dyes. And a lot of these plants are wild, grown wildly, other ones grown in our gardens, but also other ones are farmed like indigo or cochineal insect. Um, and those are the two most important elements to create the colors and uh, the most expensive and uh, the two that uh, was lost many generations ago. 
because they rely on a market to not only feed their family, but also to be able to preserve their tradition. Um, so if when there's not a market for indigo nor for cochineal insect, uh, they're not only going to go and find work elsewhere, but also uh, a tradition, and in this case, an ancestor to do tradition would absolutely uh, disappear. Thanks. Perhaps uh, I'm not sure whether Lise or Lisa want to respond to it. Or somebody else. I, I want to add something about um, in the case of, of the work that we have been doing here with ICP in Puerto Rico. Um, in the case of ICP, we the artisans that affiliate to the institution have to go through a very through a evaluation process, um, and it depends specifically on the way that they do their work and the type of materials that they use. And they have to be native and, and, and what we call noble materials in order for them to be affiliate, affiliated with ICP. And actually more than 90% of the artisans that participate in all our different events, be it first or the cultural factories or that have presence in our mobile app or you know, the different workshops, are full-time artisans. It's not a hobby, it's not like souvenirs, nor handcrafts, nothing like that. Um, one of the things, things is that in the case of Puerto Rico, being an island, um, there are some materials that need to be imported. And that's something that has had to have some kind of like to, to be to juggle in the equation because the law says that it needs to be just like native materials, but some textiles, for example. So we do have people in Puerto Rico that do, uh, that weave the cotton from, from cotton of Puerto Rico, from cotton flowers of Puerto Rico. But there are some other type of textiles, for example, that we do not have in Puerto Rico because our weather or, you know, and, and because being an island, we don't have that other type of uh, scenario where you can have just like, uh, I don't know, like different uh, weathers or, you know, that people grow some other kind of, of materials or, you know, especially raw materials, special raw materials. So, but, but in that sense, the work that we do to develop the entrepreneurial, entrepre, entrepre, entrepreneurial <laughs> uh, development of our artisans directly strengthens the the, art, the the craft ecosystem in Puerto Rico. Este, so yeah. Thank you. I'm just you. I'm just thinking about the, the question asked. Very interesting one, which is directly maybe aim towards the production. You know, which which normally is craft craft person do. do you know, they produce things and they sell it, but. There's an interesting economic uh, study, maybe, or thinking to have, which the, with the crafts itself made by everybody who just do things for themselves, which is not an exchange, an economical exchange in the sense of, you know, value with money, but it's it's an it's it has some economic value somehow, and uh, maybe it's a new f new field to to develop. Just a, it's just a thought. Thanks. I I have have perhaps a question which links up with with this, um, and it's actually about uh, typologies. Um, so it links up with with your your presentation, Antoine, but also with the other, because we we are now building a project in, in Antwerp with uh, Mark and Joke and others who are here, um, which is about um, the tools and instruments, uh, developing tools and instruments which can help, uh, which can sustain craftspeople who want to live from their craft economically, um, among other things, but especially economically, I guess. Um, and we, uh, we have seen 
different tools and instruments in the in the lecture of uh, Jessa. There was a, a website, uh, a market. Um, you can have workshops and you can uh, uh, support workshops and so forth. But it might be the case, and it I, th I think it could, it, it's very likely to be the case that every type of instrument will cater a different need and a different type of um, craftsmanship. Um, so I can imagine that that there are there are people who who invest in their crafts, especially with the, the idea of uh, yeah, preserving a tradition. Others will perhaps more um, invest in it for um, yeah, for other reasons or for more economic reasons. And depending on, on, on the type of uh, craft and the motivation behind it, you will, you will be or will not be um, um, uh, inclined to, to, um, yeah, to, to sign in, in in a workshop or, or to collaborate uh, in a website initiative or to come to a market and so forth. So is there an idea of there being um, a typology of uh, a, 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 yeah, a selection mechanism? If you have, for instance, a, a market, uh, will you then attract other craftspeople? Uh, compared to a, a website or compared to something which supports um, um, craftspeople with a with a workshop uh, format or something like that, is there any sense of there being yeah, different types of craftspeople with different needs? Actually, that's that's the basic question. But I'm I'm not sure uh, who well who is addressed by this question now. That's I'll leave it up to you. To respond to it, because if we if we want to devise a project, we need to we need to be clear about what are the needs and and uh, which type of crafts people are related have have, have which type of need. I think that's, that's yeah. the question. I can I can say something about it, Bert. Yes, go ahead. Um. I think it depends on how uh, uh, craft is already almost um, like, for instance, hand embroidery is not possible anymore in Belgium because of the wages are too expensive and the craft is too time consuming. So you have a big difference and a gap in between these crafts that are really not possible anymore as a way of earning your money. And you have the crafts, of course, where you still can have you make can make a product although it has to be very expensive always because the craftsman and that's a big difference if uh, where do you yeah oh, in which way where part of the planet you are you're doing your crafts mm -hmm. yeah. and that was the confrontation i had because um, um uh, two afghan and brothers they just came to ask me for work and it, I had to really explain it why it was not possible to work mm. in Belgium. And even now, I sometimes have to re-explain it again and mm. again. So yeah, we did. Yeah. A, I, I had to explain how a cost structure in Belgium yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. it's not only about typology, but it's about context as well. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and then it's very different. Um, yeah, from where you live. And then, of course, if you see there is only 10% of the no of the textile uh, industries in Belgium, only 10%. I asked the question a, lo a lot of times already to, um, to um, productions. Uh, can, can, can there be a relocation of this? Is there, is there a possibility to relocate this Thing because if you want to be circular, you have to be have to have a circular economy. Maybe mm -hmm. there is there there is a sort of um, opportunity to 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 uh, to that crafts gets way get their mm -hmm. value economically again more. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a question I always put um, yeah. for me. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. I'm not sure whether somebody else wants to 
add something to that? Or? I think there is an interesting research in the, in the UK a couple of years ago. Uh, the first one was in 2015, and the list has recently been updated. It's called the, the Red List of Endangered Crafts, which is a nice typology of several crafts uh, that, are, that still have an eco economic value, as Lise explained. Uh, but there are, there are several factors that you have to take into account. It's not only the economy, but also the, um, the possibility of learning the craft, uh, the age of the, the teachers, for example. So they have made a whole typology of crafts. Mm. Uh, they have an interesting list and they know perfectly which craft is endangered and which craft has a specific uh, future. And the list can be found uh, online on the website of the Heritage Crafts Association. Ah, okay, yeah. yeah. I'm going to write that down. Nice. Yeah. And it's the aim of ETWI to uh, make a Belgian list of endangered crafts, but um, it's a bit complicated. That's why I asked Antoine about the methodology, because it's not uh, very easy to come to a yeah. scientific methodology on the one hand and engage uh, craftsmen and women yeah. in, such a, in such a survey. But, uh, yeah. yeah, that triggered my question, because not everybody is interested in, in living from it in an economic way, of course, it can be no. just amateurs who want to keep the tradition going from for other reasons and, and so that, that that triggered my question actually yes yeah. but in a bed uh yeah not to show at least you're on my screen <laughs> uh i think yes i was also yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, yes sir, first, not that Okay, not that in our case, artisans are affiliated with us. So all the different initiatives that we do are only for those artisans that are affiliated with ICP. Um, and actually what happens is, for example, in, in the case of fairs, tomorrow we are going to start Campechada and we have 133 artisans participated uh, among all other artists and you know, in, in different este, sectors. And the thing is that more people want to participate in because now we have COVID and, you know, and all this new scenario, even though even though we are doing it all throughout all San Juan, uh, we cannot have as much people as normally this kind of event can have. And, and in the other type of este, initiatives, like for example, the different workshops that we do, um, we open a, a, an application process to all the artisans that are affiliated with us. And then they have to, you know, they have to apply. And we have a group of people that are outside of ICP that have a different sets of uh, a rubrica and elements that based on those elements, they uh, select the participants of those initiatives. In the case of, for example, the app, um, we our database, one of the things that I did once I started in ICP was really um, putting together all the information in a database and having it uh, updated and uniform that, ha that hadn't happened before. Everything was on paper. So we just migrated all that information and all the different data that we had been uh, getting throughout the past four years and migrated it to the application. And, and actually all of these, the, the, the areas of the workshops that we have been offering in the entrepreneurial aspect, with the entrepreneurial aspect, they all come from a, a survey that was done, there were two surveys. One was done in 2013, and that was a, throughout the different, a, like artists and cultural uh, uh, practitioners. And then the other one was in 2015. And based on those needs was that we develop the different uh, workshops on entrepreneurial mindset and all that that we have been working on. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I have to say that when I started in ICP, Everyone thought that I was doing all this kind of stuff because I was so young, you know, and some of the more traditional artisans were like, eh, maybe she doesn't get us or, you know, and, or we don't like that this like new digital way of doing uh, things. And actually that has shifted amazingly because now they, they like sometimes even like, like very old or traditional artisans are actually very enthusiastic in participating on all these different platforms which 
sometimes I'm I'm even like you know I'm astonished because they see the the output you know they see the outcome and they see how through ICT they can get to new different uh, audiences that they didn't have before. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, if anybody has references to that kind of uh, material and insights. Can, always can you already yeah. share the, the the can you share the 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 research that you said that it that was done in the UK? Please. No. Oh yeah, that's uh, for you. I will put it in the in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Liz, you still have something to no? Okay. Well, I don't have anything in the chat anymore, and I don't have hands up anymore. And we are beyond the, um, the schedule now. And it has been a long day, of course, especially for those in Europe for whom it's already late in the evening. So I think we can wrap it up here. Uh, I, had a, I had a very, very wonderful experience. So I, I, just, I just want to thank you all. Uh, uh, thanks for being here so long. It, the, the idea was first to have a, a day or even a two day workshop, but um, yeah, Corona forced us to change the, the format uh, again. And um, therefore it was a really stuffed program, of course, to, uh, being behind the screen so long is, uh, is, is, is a totally different effort, uh, of course. So thank you very much. Thanks, especially the speakers, of course. And then thanks to my co-organizers, uh, especially Mark, and also the, the administration here in Berkeley, Maya Cisneros. I'm not sure whether she's here still among us. Uh, but thank you all. And um, well, as we will be developing or try at least to develop projects which are in, in line with what we have been doing here, um, I think the odds are high that you will hear from us again in the hopefully not so distant future. So uh, I hope to see you again, and uh, I hope it can be live and in person then. Uh, so that's it for me. Um, thanks, everybody, and see you later. Um, bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>